Techna Capital, a solar accelerationist primer. A critique of the technological economy. By Alex Kotoff. Also known as Transhumania. Sector Zero, Intro to Technomics. The entire history of all hitherto existing society, and by extension, all life itself, is a history of thermodynamic struggle. The story of Homo sapiens can be best characterized as a 3.5 billion year long battle with entropy, a quest for more time. Humanity's first work of literature, the Epic of Gilgamesh, an archetypal quest for immortality, which Silicon Valley techno optimists have begun to asymptotically approach through the genomics and information revolution. Negentropy. Extropy. Omega point. Singularity. The Meliorist narrative has many names, but all share an intrinsic commonality in the same recursive eschatological breakaway for the production of more time energy. From the discovery of our opposable thumbs with which we created campfires, and thereby, the social habits necessary to develop language, to the heat of the fire with which we cooked our food, thereby tripling caloric surplus for the brain, to post-industrial urbanization, thereby tripling life expectancy. The general convergence of labor saving technologies and economic growth have thus far continued on a self sustaining path in defiance of heat death. But for how long? All technological input is rooted in but ill's solar economy, an accursed share which includes the non recuperable multi million year old primordial fossil fuel biomass, for which market speculation has overestimated the reserves. The past century of ecological discourse has given rise to the question of whether the accelerating negentropic feedback loops of the technological economy will eventually come to undermine their own self-propagation in an anthropogenic global climate crisis. To paraphrase James Ellis, should the technological economy continue to grow in its current unsustainable paradigm, perhaps everything will ultimately return to zero. If commodity fetishism ultimately subverts acceleration at the ecological level, perhaps then, the greatest acceleration is achieved by having capital accelerate with the expansion of the sun, not ahead of it. As was previously observed by Baroque Spiral, Nickland himself appears to acknowledge the possibility for an ecological accelerationism in his essay Teleoplexy. Notes on acceleration, though in a non-humanistic, non-moralistic sense, quote, a negative conclusion, to the problem of measuring teleoplexy, if fully elaborated, would necessarily produce an adequate ecological theory of the Anthropocene. Nick Land, the accelerationist reader. End quote. Land's work betrays a concern for whether capital would be able to measure its own progress since neoclassical theory does not allow it to do so and this neglect necessitates an ecological acceleration with which the Austrian and Marxian law of value must be replaced with a more environmentally reflexive system. Land writes off the concern as something that can only be understood through technomic intensification, but the measurement of Tillow's regarding ecology's role in acceleration is nevertheless critical to the thermodynamic nature of the process. Acceleration entails a planetary intelligence capable of modeling ecological complexity just as much as requires a capacity for modeling technomic complexity. Teleoplexy, or, self-reinforcing, cybernetic intensification, describes the wavelength of machines, escaping in the direction of extreme ultraviolet, among the cosmic rays. It correlates with complexity, connectivity, machinic compression, extropy free energy dissipation, efficiency, intelligence, and operational capability, defining a gradient of absolute but obscure improvement that orients socio-economic selection by market mechanisms, as expressed through measures of productivity, competitiveness, and capital asset value. Dash and Nickland. At a certain point, negentropy may entail the classic contradiction of infinite growth on a finite planet, overcome only through extraterrestrial commoditization of helium-3 energy or new planetary real estate a la the neoliberal deep futurology of Musk or Bezos, upon which techno-utopians argue the endless thirst for GDP growth may truly grasp the cosmic infinite. Assuming that one, accelerationist, of any given Deleuzolandian persuasion, should also take the side of techno-capital and commit to nurturing its growth, for any given teleology. 
would the Anthropocene not then entail they violate modern market logic to prevent its own self-annihilation? Will the rules of neoclassical theory have to be rewritten? as they are now conflicting with a vested interest in techno-capital not outstripping its own capacity for growth? Will our cyberpunk dystopia have to go solar? Situated in a productive stage where the labor of the organic, ecological is still somewhat critical to sustain its own propagation, neoliberalism may be forced to defy its roots in Austrian theory and deterritorialize, re-territorialize in the name of its own survival mutating via shocks in the pricing mechanisms of labor, materials and forcing the system to confront its existential vulnerability to the anthropogenic climate crisis, for which it must be taught to infer how resources are being used at rates faster than at which the solar economy can replenish them. For most of the dismal science's history, authentic environmental consciousness has always been antithetical to the field, which limits discussion to a limited scope of optimization. In this framework, famous neoclassical and post-Keynesian economists are renowned for their aggrandized dismissals of the future, as Keynes himself once nihilistically proclaimed, in the long run, we are all dead. A fitting attitude with which every economist since Paul Samuelson's neoclassical synthesis has justified their nearsighted legislation regarding mass ecological devastation in exchange for short-term economic growth. Although, Younger generations of environmentally oriented thought have not been too keen on being dead in the long run, remaining what one might call pro technological growth or pro SIF rather than zero growth or anti SIF, yet, they still call for the process to fundamentally reformulate its theoretical conception of value to develop a sense of its thermodynamic speed limits. Developing this market sensitivity would require extreme alterations to axioms within the neoclassical synthesis and a break with the traditional non-interventionist approach of contemporary accelerationist thought. This new approach would instead embrace a counterintuitively pro-growth, yet simultaneously, pro-ecological stance that one might term solar accelerationist or solar acceleration, more colloquially known as the solar punk aesthetic a marginal branch of environmentally conscious politics, unique in the sense that they do not entail a zero-growth economy nor necessarily an end to the market or the commodity form. Insofar as the labor of the ecological remains an essential component to sustain the process, solar acceleration can be considered an emancipatory post-Marxist but also post-neoclassical project for sustainability, rejecting unconditional acceleration passivity, Zero acceleration Malthusianism, right acceleration belief in capital self sustenance, and any left acceleration endeavors toward zero growth futures. Solar acceleration can be thought of as an interventionist regrounding of techno capital within the hard sciences, namely, thermodynamics, climate science, and the solar economy, all for the sake of its own survival. While solar acceleration's softening of the Anthropocene's ecological blow to the global south, its emphasis on accountability for landlords, and its decreasing environmental alienation are all pleasant byproducts of the approach, humanism is not the central goal of solar acceleration, as it is with other ecologically conscious thought, the project remains post-humanist in theory, rejecting many categorical divisions between subject and object, as well as divisions between man machine, and ecology. This will encompass gradually less rhetoric about climate change threatening the human species. And perhaps more unfamiliar rhetoric about climate change threatening your 401k. Rather than the traditional reactionary or primitivist anti sif diagnosis of too many humans being born, the solar accelerationist conception instead insists that our present-day ecological issues have more to do with problems of energy accounting going unnoticed in the neoliberal order, for which a new law of value is necessitated to replace subjective marginal utility, a theory which, one can argue, makes capital blind to threats concerning its own existence. There is growing institutional consensus that neither post-Keynesian nor neoclassical economic theories possess the proper pricing mechanisms for appraising any thermodynamic conceptions of supply and demand, and thus, solar acceleration calls for an ecologically grounded thermodynamic theory of value if capital is to survive the coming market correction of all market corrections, peak oil and all adjacent anti-SIF apocalypsia.
defying all expectations, Silicon Valley industrialists have also come to sideline the reactionary and Luddite's condemnation of human beings as a plague upon the planet, turning away from Faustian eco-fascist collapsitarianism and more toward new Promethean physiocratic green capitalist solutions for the global climate crisis. Perhaps even abandoning rhetoric about population control in favor of new market logics more focused on keeping techno-economic growth in check with thermodynamic growth what could also be called solar growth. Solar accelerationism can be interpreted as the inverse of zero accelerationist renunciation, suggesting that contradictions within the techno-commercialist runaway process can be circumnavigated by simply redefining market growth to be consistent with thermodynamics, such that the technological economy can become commensurate with climate science and avert self-annihilation. If techno-capital itself is to survive the heat death of the biosphere and sustain itself at this early stage of growth, then it must temporarily shrink the accursed share in favor of equilibrium with the sun, until commodity production can leave terror. This can be done by challenging neoliberalism's definition of value as subjective marginal utility, first put forth by Karl Menger of the Austrian school, and restructuring scarcity in terms of waste entropy and exergy, stored free energy. This will serve to incorporate climate supply demand feedback into capital so it can survive its own suicide, thus, solar acceleration promises nothing less than a Copernican revolution against establishment neoclassical theory. This assertion necessitates the groundwork for a new heterodox law of value. A law of value grounded in physical sciences with an objective axiological conception, returning to discredited pre-classical pre-Marxian thought, rather than the agnostic or subjective conception of value, Keynesian and Austrian, dominant after the neoclassical synthesis. Additionally, solar accelerationism also explores possible applications of an energy-backed cryptocurrency, formalizing value through a convergent synthesis of the technological economy with the political economy. Solar acceleration may entertain Murray Bookchin, Howard Scott, and the late Chicks Fresco's forgotten memeplexes of an energy accounting system driving said currency, which will track net input from the solar, natural environment, how quickly the output can be extracted, and how efficiently the excess thermodynamic waste output can be disposed of, a so-called thermodynamic budget for which markets can learn to anticipate existentially concerned limits on production. The future of both capital and all biodiversity on terror as well as human, or post-human, vitalism, will depend on the degree to which this pricing mechanism for ecological health can be incorporated into the business cycle. Economics must become a hard science if the market is to successfully navigate the climate crisis, and thus, its definition of value must too be grounded in the physical sciences. To reformulate economic value in terms of thermodynamics, let us begin by challenging the very scientific validity for the current theory of value in modern economics, the subjective marginal utility theory of value. The assertion that value comes from desire satisfaction, which we will question as a legitimate academic discipline through the lens of scientific entity realism. The credence of neoclassical economics will be questioned via proof by contradiction, perhaps best described as a simple syllogism. Premise 1 Science is the study of falsifiable natural and social phenomena that can be measured quantitatively. Premise 2, Economics is the science of the consumption, production, and transfer of value. Premise 3, The dominant law of value in modern neoclassical economics is the subjective marginal utility theory of value, which defines consumption, production, and transfer of value in terms of marginal utility value determined by desire satisfaction. Premise 4, marginal utility is an unfalsifiable natural and social phenomenon and cannot actually be measured quantitatively, grounded in nothing beyond the marketing aesthetics of commodity fetishism, divorced from the historical and material reality of production, over abuse of ecology and climate as contradictory to its own self-sustaining propagation. Conclusion we arrive at a contradiction between premise 2 and 4, thus the modern paradigm of economics, derivative of Austrian a priori praxeology, is pseudoscientific, 
and this discrepancy must be rectified if the study of human behavior is to be grounded in the hard physical sciences, supervenient on the social sciences. The two immediately conceivable ways in which this contradiction can be resolved is to either challenge premise 4, that marginal utility can't be measured quantitatively, a hill which the modern eliminativist dominated neuroscience of Paul and Patricia Churchland will happily help you die on, or to reject marginal utility and propose a new theory of value altogether, based on phenomena that can be objectively measured in the conception of instrumental entity realism. To make this subjective theory of value an objective theory of value, we will need to replace marginal utility with something quantitatively measurable, and do so without returning to Marx's humanist LTV. One possible proposition is thermodynamic utility or the scientific term, exergy, a quantitative account of stored capacity for labor at a given temperature equilibrium, measured in m joules, embodied joules. Exergy refers the variable in physics that represents stored free energy at a certain temperature equilibrium with the capacity to do work, energy, that is not lost to waste heat, defined as force over time and measured in joules, with of course, force measured in newtons or mass in kilograms times acceleration. An economic theory of value grounded in exergy, which we can use interchangeably with the Marxian term surplus labor, though thermal utility is by no means a modernization or formalization of Marx's LTV, would give us the capacity to make scientific statements about the quantity of biomass or raw materials required to produce a commodity. In other words, unlike marginal utility, this will allow us to scientifically measure the physical, environmental cost of human needs, wants, or desires, as well as how quickly that physical environmental cost is recycled and circulated. This essay will be divided into four sections to rigorously define a new exegic law of value. Thermonomics, sectors 1-4. Genomics, sectors 5-8. Bionomics, sectors 9-12. Infonomics, sectors 13-16. First, thermonomics is concerned with measure of the exergy value circulation required to extract raw materials how all that exergy value is absorbed from the sun, and how quickly we can use it up before it's replenished by the sun, a measurement which will allow us to create the aforementioned resource-based currency in sector zero. Second, a system of genomics, concerned with exergy per square foot of land multiplied by its population density, such that the pricing mechanism can appraise it. In other words, Genomics is concerned with how the inefficient use or unsustainable exergy extraction of the land will be taxed and how only the inefficient use of exergy will be punished while efficient use of exergy, incentivized, transitioning to a resource-based internal revenue service. Third, a new calculation paradigm for bionomics, which measures exergy per square foot of land relative to the density of the human population and biodiversity on that land as well as how the income from the resource-based single tax system will be allocated amongst the alienated human populations and ecological conservation efforts for that land, in other words, a resource-based federal budget. Last of all, infonomics which will connect this thermodynamic spaced exergy economy to the newly emerging information economy, done with an index of nanotransactions for quasi-legal data harvesting by organizations such as the notorious Cambridge Analytica, with the goal of incentivizing, to incentivizing the human exergy expenditure allocated to social media use to be in supply-demand equilibrium with the surplus labor needed for production of that information by measure of Claude Shannon's information entropy. These will set the cybernetic parameters for a resource-based economy, where techno-capital won't outstrip its own capacity for growth by alienation of the users that sustain the production of information, defined in terms of Schrodinger's negentropy. Let us begin by grounding economics in basic thermodynamics. Sector 1, Exergy and Thermeconomics Thermeconomics or energy accounting economics is based on the proposition that economics should be grounded in the physical sciences, the technological economy and materialist adjacent schools of thought. In order to graduate to a hard science of human behavior, thermonomics must be predicated on the study of observer-independent phenomena like molecules, rather than idealist observer-independent phenomena, as with commodity fetishism, 
derivative of subjective marginal utility. The neglect of thermodynamics has led to a grift economy characterized by a frenzy of bubbles, overvaluations, and overextraction of terrors slow to regenerate hydrocarbon fuel. To have an exergy based theory of value, we will need to scientifically describe how exergy is produced, consumed, traded, and most importantly, how much exergy input we get from physical solar discharge, how much of that goes into, or comes out of, the ground how much of it can be used efficiently, and how much of the inevitable waste can be disposed of. A scientifically grounded political economy entails that the role of energy in the ecosystem should be defined and understood through the famous three laws of thermodynamics. They read as such. 1. Law number 1 concerns enthalpy, symbol H. Energy cannot be created or destroyed, only turned into heat enthalpy and then transferred. For an economy this means there cannot be infinite output in a system without infinite input, to quote Kenneth Building. Anyone who believes that exponential growth can go on forever on a finite planet is either a madman or an economist. H equals E. W where the greater than zero. So. Enthalpy equals energy minus work where energy is greater than zero. All work produced from energy can be transferred through enthalpy. 2. Law number 2 concerns entropy, symbol S, disorder increases in all isolated systems and they will all leak waste enthalpy over time. For an economy this means that all thermodynamic processes will create inevitably environmental waste, to quote the famous Greek proverb. Only once the last tree has been chopped, the last river poisoned, and the last fish caught, will man realize he cannot eat money. S equals H t where d s zero. So, entropy equals enthalpy over time where entropy is greater than or equal to zero. All work produced from energy will leak enthalpy over time as entropy. 3. Law number 3 concerns exergy, symbol B. Exergy is described by Josiah Willard Gibbs as useful free energy, and the third law of thermodynamics suggests that perfect 100% conversion efficiency of energy into exergy without any waste entropy is only possible at absolute zero, but absolute zero is physically impossible to reach, thus we have economic scarcity defined as a finite amount of useful exergy before the heat death of the biosphere. For an economy. This means we must take care to use what little exergy we have as responsibly and efficiently as possible until it's replenished by the sun, what you can consider the fancy scientific way to phrase the quote. We do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. B equals H, T, S, where D S zero. So. Exergy equals enthalpy minus time and entropy where entropy is greater than or equal to zero. All work produced from energy and leaking enthalpy through entropy at any given temperature of a heat reservoir has a maximum exergy. All successful economic systems must be commensurate with these laws in order to properly reflect material reality, or succumb to the ungrounded Austrian commodity fetishism by way of subjective marginal utility. While these three laws may look very complicated, they can largely be summed up in layman's terms as Law 1 equals you can't win. Law 2 equals you can't break even. Law 3 equals you can't leave the game. The general economic conclusion of these three laws is that, while time and energy are infinite in this universe, what we call exergy, extra pure free energy, is not infinite, and this is what it makes it inherently valuable. Regardless of what kind of organism you are, economics is ultimately based on scarcity what one might call the first order drive of all human behavior, and the necessary first principle in any new economic theory entails define axioms of value within the theory in terms of scarcity. The way you define what is valuable will come to characterize what kind of society this theory will instantiate. Exergy or extropy, to borrow from Max Moore's neo-proactionary school of Silicon Valley neoliberal transhumanist thought is the objective thermodynamic capacity to create greater order, higher potentiality, and more useful energy for the well-being of vitalistic organizational systems, thus putting this at the center of our economic theory entails, by way of emergence, 
a very different society than the neoclassical framework, with its first principles built solely on marginal utility. In thermonomics, we've defined what is scarce, and thus, what is valuable, but orthodox economic theories, of the classical, neoclassical, and Keynesian persuasion, have failed to do so with the same level of groundedness. Classicalism, the name given to theorists such as Malthus, Ricardo, and Smith, who argued value comes from the specialization and division of labor. Marxism, theorists like Marx and Kautsky, goes without saying, argued in a humanist sense, that value comes from surplus labor extracted through exploitation. Neoclassicalism, popularized by Austrian school theorist Friedrich Hayek and later, monetarist, Chicago school theorist Milton Friedman, who argued all value is derived from subjective marginal utility. Post-Keynesianism takes an agnostic approach originally laid out by John Maynard Keynes, where value comes from price, an idea that played its own role in the 2008 financial crisis, alongside the neoclassicalists' deregulation of the banks. The problem with all these orthodox theories is, while they incorporate labor, utility, and price into their equations, they all leave out one essential variable. Exergy, which is supervenient on all the aforementioned concepts. Most establishment economic theories are incompatible with basic thermodynamics and are thus vulnerable to a quasi-scientific obfuscations of material reality. Any theory of economic value that doesn't account for the objective observer-independent environment will not be able to measure its own effects on the biosphere and terrestrial homeostasis. To paraphrase economist Stephen Keen, any theory of economics that is to give us an accurate account of reality should at least be consistent with thermodynamics and physics. Given the existential climate risks that face our planet today we find ourselves in desperate need for a new heterodox scientifically grounded theory of economics that will be capable of the energy accounting needed to ensure our economic growth doesn't outstrip our technological capacity to extract exergy and dispose of waste energy. Any neoclassical theory based on subjective marginal utility of one's wants and desires will never develop a better pricing mechanism than a theory grounded in scientific material conditions. How does the saying go? Facts don't care about your feelings. You only need take secondary school physics to understand that there is no conception of value based on subjective human perception can possibly be calculable or sustainable as human wants and desires are not only impossible to measure, but also limitless. Economics and environmental pollution are inseparably linked, as the three laws of thermodynamics can be read in sequence to demonstrate how waste can only be reduced not eliminated. Law 1 says energy can't be created or destroyed it can only be converted into work, E, W equals H, to greater than zero. Law 2 says you only convert energy into 100% work at absolute zero Kelvin, S equals H, T, D S zero. Law 3 says absolute zero can never be reached only asymptotically approached, B equals H, T S, D S zero. Which takes us to the conclusion that any notion of a purely rational market based on subjective human wants and desires is pseudo-scientific and untenable. There will always be environmental waste entropy whether your neoliberalism is green or grey, as there is not a single place in our universe that is absolute zero. Subjective marginal utility is blind to waste entropy and only the incorporation of thermonomics will allow capital to survive the anthropogenic crisis. Modern green capitalism still stuck in the neoclassical synthesis is not sufficient for this task, as for instance, even the environmentally friendly Tesla cars can have net carbon dioxide emissions through waste of lithium extraction, when contrasted with the longevity of the engine. Unless it is grounded in a thermodynamic theory of value, even Silicon Valley's green neoliberalism will outstrip Technocapital's capacity for survival. So how does Therm Economics plan to track this? The principles are quite simple under a Therm Economic accounting system, there may be countless outputs but we can track them all back to only one input. The sun. Accelerationist consensus tends to posit that neoliberal capitalism can go on in perpetuity, 
but this assumption is highly contingent on whether it keeps pace with solar input until it can replace its organic workforce, at present required to sustain the process. The sun is the giver and taker of all life, which is why we find it necessary that any theory of post-capitalist meliorism must posit some flavor of solar accelerationism or thermodynamic accelerationism to survive on the cosmic scale. Recursively bootstrapping capitalist acceleration can only make it to level 2, the absurd sci-fi limits of Dyson spheres and Niven rings, where an organic Terran workforce is no longer required, if it homeostatically learns to self-regulate and keep pace with solar input. The Landian teleoplexic runaway process is kept in check only by extraterrestrial input. So we understand very well that solar accelerationism will be a very temporary paradigm and that, upon capturing the sun, this self-perpetuating assemblage can always find another one. So in that sense, neoliberals could say the stars are the limit, with solar acceleration being only a temporary alliance of survival between human and post-human or between the biotic, ecological and the abiotic. The problem with neoclassical economics ultimately reduces to the fact that their theory of value has no cap on the number of outputs that can be added for every input over time, so unless this surplus is made directly proportional to the energy taken from the sun collapse is inevitable, no matter how much you recycle or how many based technologies Daddy Musk invents. Production is only possible because the earth is an open system with surplus particles coming from the sun namely stored as fossil fuel, and once all sources of land accessible fossil fuels are exhausted, a post-collapse humanity will have to wait millions of years for these fossil fuels to replenish before they can kickstart another industrial revolution, as creating a second industrial revolution post-collapse would require a Palin genetic Bronze Age humanity to either have deep-sea drilling technology or wait millions of years for land-based fossil fuels to regenerate from dead biomass. Make no mistake, if we exhaust our easily accessible sources of fossil fuels and post-collapse humanity fails to reinvent deep-sea drilling, the next dark age will last not centuries but eons. The stakes for interpreting value as subjective marginal utility are incalculable, both for capitalism and the human species itself. Capital must learn to perfect our extraction of the solar economy directly before peak oil is reached or face the possibility of never being able to reboot itself. Although, in addition to the sun, a secondary energy input exists as the energy of cosmic rays and the remains of high-pressure energy of supernovas that formed heavy elements like uranium and thorium, making up the much less popular but still preferable nuclear fuel, but such technology would still be highly inaccessible to a post-collapse humanity. Regardless of where our next energy input comes from, all economies, whether they are agricultural economies, labor economies, information economies, imagination economies, or attention economies, must ultimately grounded in what we call a resource-based economy, again, not to be conflated with Marx's LTV, which will set the precedent for how quickly that economy can restrict its own growth to remain sustainable. All of the money in the world will not grow an economy unless it can be efficiently exchanged for sustainable energy flow. In summary, we must always remember the three rules of energy fight club. Rule 1 of energy fight club, enthalpy, you can't win the fight, you can only break even, rule 2, entropy, you can't break even unless you leave the fight, and rule 3, scarcity, you cannot leave the fight because you can never reach absolute zero, not even at the end of the universe. These three rules bring us to the conclusion that the Earth's finite exergy store can't satisfy the infinite growth of our limitless desires, and this deservingly necessitates orienting exergy the center of all value. Our wants and desires must keep pace with stored energy, not vice versa, and that is why we must ultimately reject subjective marginal utility. Again, Austrians could speculate that one day we'll mine asteroids and build Dyson spheres to extract the limitless energy of the sun. But it misses the point that modern conceptions of global economic growth must stay within the boundaries of our current technological capacities in order to reach future technological capacities, where a disagreement may be found between solar acceleration and right acceleration as to whether techno-capital is yet in a position to be self-sustaining. 
To learn how we will set the incentive structures to accomplish this, we will have to revisit a 350 year old school of economists called the physiocrats. Sector 2 Physiocracy and Technocracy Therm economics has its origins in the physiocrat tradition of pre industrial royalist France, predating even the birth of Adam Smith. The physiocrats encompass three main thinkers Cantillon, Quesnay, and Turger, who all believed that the sun was the root of all value, and by extension, economics must be grounded in the land. They namely believed that the wealth of nations was derived recursively from the value of agriculture, which can and should be measured. In fact, some of the physiocrats directly influenced Adam Smith in his visit to France, some of their ideas carried onward to the Wealth of Nations published in 1776 inches. What makes the physiocrats important to solar acceleration is that their central economic thesis is a thermodynamic proposition, the proposition that all wealth comes from the land, not from gold, as was the case with their rival school, the mercantilists. Thus national economic policy should take the calculation of land into account. Contrary to the Marxians and Classicals, who argued the roots of all value could best be described in terms of labor, as well as the Austrians and Neoclassicals, who argued value could best be described in terms of subjective exchange, the physiocrats actually argued that the root of all value could most accurately described in objective terms through thermodynamic circulation tracking the way land value is transformed into all other derivative forms of value. The physiocrats were also the first to advocate for a decentralized economy, which would later influence Smith's idea of laissez-faire, describing human economic activity as a dissipative system that flourishes by consuming free energy in transformations or exchange of resources, goods, and services. The physiocrats arguably founded therm economic discourse when they acknowledged the impossibility of net output without energy input, to quote Turger. Nature, all that she grants is a physical consequence of the fertility of the soil, Turger 1795. As one might have easily predicted, the French monarchy ignored physiocratic thought, which is unfortunate for them, because responsible energy accounting during the ensuing famine could, literally, have saved them their heads. François Quesnay, considered to be the central figure in physiocracy, published the Tableau Economique in 1758, which provided the foundations of economics from an analytic perspective, where value did not come from labor or capital, because those things themselves are created from and contingent on energetic relations. Quesnay, originally a personal doctor for the King of France, advocated a so-called circularity theory of economics which compares the circulation of goods and services to the circulation of finite blood in the human body. The closest analog to a modern theory of energy accounting. Unfortunately by 1767, Quesnay's book had disappeared from academic thought and few complete copies could be procured, thus only secondary sources remain of this long-lost economic school of thought. Later in his life, Quesnay went on to study the more technocratic Chinese economy and later himself came to be dubbed the Confucius of Europe. Pricing mechanisms and the wisdom of crowds aside, whether this thermodynamic value of an economy is highly centralized or decentralized is geopolitically contextual. For instance, in his book Le Despotisme de la Chine, Quesnay even spoke favorably of the fringe political ideology we today would recognize as technocracy where Quesnay supported a more meritocratic system giving scholars and technological experts economic leverage rather than giving it to the spoiled aristocrats who held power in his native France, powers with which Quesnay was not very popular with due to his enthusiasm for taxing land rather than labor. Quesnay's ideas were passed on to his student and Robert Jacques Turger, who became the first economist to discover the law of diminishing marginal returns, later himself becoming the French Empire's finance minister. He too recognized surrounding thermodynamic relations as fundamental to a theory of value. What he called the pure gift, quote, The farmer produces more output than input because of superfluidity, which nature accords him as a pure gift. The physiocrats can be contrasted with earlier economic schools, in particular, mercantilism, which defined the law of value as the nation's wealth in gold, 
an economic theory which didn't work out so well for the Spanish Empire when their gold-based theory of value resulted in crippling hyperinflation as a byproduct of excessive colonial exploitation. The physiocrat school advocated minimal economic intervention outside of land accounting, quasi laissez-faire, while the mercantilist school advocated strong economic restrictions, protectionist tariffs, and state monopolies. But the greatest contrast was indeed how the physiocrats argued it was energetic productivity, not gold, that made a nation wealthy, and it is our return to this surprisingly simple theory that may rescue techno capital in the long run. The physiocrats advocated three core goals. 1. Abolition of all tax for one single tax on efficient use of the land. 2. A resource based economy where land is the origin of all value. 3. A small decentralized government with minimal interference in the planning of production. Just like Adam Smith and Karl Marx, the physiocrats recognized a class structure, each perceiving value differently based on their proximity to production, the agricultural class with a resource-based theory of value, the industrial class with a labor-based theory of value, and the owner class with an exchange theory of value. It begins with a simple premise. Production equals resources plus labor plus capital. Assuming solar input and therm economics as the study of zeroth order exergy, to make any commodity we ultimately require three economic strata to describe production. 1. Land, first order exergy, exergy taking the form of raw materials found in nature, we will revisit this in the geoeconomics section. 2. Labor, second order exergy, being human effort required to shape those raw materials, but humans themselves technically are a special form of raw materials, we will revisit this in bioeconomics section. 3. Capital, third order exergy, which are tools, machinery, or debt required to enable the shaping of raw material by laborers, which today is less frequently seen to take the form of factories and more the form of digital media platforms, we will revisit this in info economics. Each one of these is derived from the last, with value grounded in solar input locked into Terran ecology, zeroth order exergy. Thus we can observe how all value is based on the surprising self-replicating behavior of raw materials, turning itself into people and machines, but it was only the physiocrat school ever took this derivative view of human behavior into account within their economic axioms for value. Labor without energy is a corpse and capital without energy is a sculpture, with which we can conclude that there should be a place for exergy per unit GDP within our standard metrics for calculation. In that sense thermodynamics and economics are interdependently and inseparably linked, perhaps best described as the study of how human behavioral systems react to their surroundings. Only through these relationships will we be able to properly model an economy and its value, thus, allowing for the creation proper economic policy and successful socio-political theory. But how exactly do we know that the physiocrats were right? Well for one, it's no coincidence that 8 out of the 10 largest countries in the world just so happen to be within the top 10 wealthiest countries in the world, and this is not directly correlated with population but more with abundance of natural resources which can then be reinvested to accumulate capital recursively using Marx's CMC circuit, and then be reinvested to acquire increasingly more natural resources in an exponentially bootstrapping runaway process. For example, the intervention of the US military in the Middle East and the rise of the petrodollar economy demonstrates the principles of physiocrat economics very clearly, as an economy can't be sustained by subjective marginal utility alone. The SP500 is the bubble and energy production is the reality, a reality only actually revealed in times of crisis like the 1973 energy crisis or the 2008 financial crash. Behind every fake mask that is a nation's stock market, there is always a thermodynamic market correction lying like a sleeping giant, waiting to be woken. Now that we have established the solar economy as the terrestrial speed limit for economic growth, how might we account for it quantitatively? Energy accounting can't be done in the neoclassical conception of a free market, as modern neoclassical market incentives are blind to ecological limits, so will we need a centrally planned economy? 
How do we ensure sustainable regulation of the market? Will we need the Federal Reserve to shift from a fiat-backed currency to a currency backed by annual efficient energy use per capita? Will Wall Street ever be capped by the annual national energy production in a centralized way? Or can this energy accounting be done in a decentralized way, using democratic and constitutional principles? Perhaps economic measurements could benefit to incorporate things like the efficiency of kilojoules converted into useful commodities, or the fact that the surplus of outputs to inputs in intertwined in feedback loops with surrounding systems should we perhaps create an economic system that incentivizes the maximization of extropy, or abolish all taxes for a single entropy tax on thermodynamic or ecological inefficiency. Should we force investment into sustainability and renewable energy? These are all good points, but to get the solution we will have to revisit the physiocrat's discourse between anarchy and technocracy. Physiocrat thought wasn't the end of therm economics, a few centuries later it underwent a rebirth through the even lesser known school of thought. Almost a hundred years ago, there was a significantly more fringe movement during the Great Depression that tried to do a rough combination of the physiocrats' ideas with New Deal politics, they were called the Technocracy Movement, a left-wing political action committee founded by Howard Scott and M. King Hubbard, who would later develop the theory of peak oil. In 1932 they founded the think tank Technocracy Incorporated which proposed that money be replaced by energy certificates and the value of the market be determined by a scientifically grounded theory of economics, with special concern given to sustainability within the resource base rather than just profitability. Technocracy Incorporated advocated a system of governance where policy was drafted by credentialed experts rather than campaign-funded politicians with conflicting interests and affiliations, guiding the economy into a thermodynamically balanced load of production input and consumption output. They saw socio-political issues as technical or engineering problem, with which application of the scientific method could help solve social problems like recession and inflation. To accomplish this the technocrats called for reorganizing society into post-national technates, where in place of government lobbying and corporations, it would instead be scientists and engineers who would make legislation for capping energy use, which included policies like a nationwide annual energy report from which they would allocate energy certificates to citizens and factories in place of money, thereby capping their unsustainability and simultaneously providing scientifically objective market data to prevent the Great Depression from ever occurring again. As an alternative to the New Deal, Scott proposed that money be replaced by energy certificates denominated in units such as ergs or joules, equivalent in total amount to an appropriate national net energy budget, and then distributed responsibly with respect to resource availability. To quote the book An Introduction to Technocracy. Any unit of value under a price system is a certification of debt. Any unit of measurement under technological control would be a certification of available energy converted. Such units of certification would have validity only during the balanced load period for which they were issued. This method of producing physical wealth and measuring its operation precludes the possibility of creating any kind of debt. It also eliminates the entire domain of philanthropy. Furthermore, all bonds, financial debentures, and other instrumentalities of debt would cease to exist, since they do not have one iota of usefulness in the physical operation of such an area under technological control. End quote. Excerpt from, Introduction to Technocracy. iBooks. Link to a free PDF of this book in the description below. Pictured here is an official emblem of Howard Scott's technocracy movement. Technocracy is a bold idea but its list of flaws are endless. Mostly tracing back to the fact that technocratist politics advocate manual central planning. One manifestation of this problem is that causal path entropy is virtually impossible to measure, and trying to do so in a centralized manner would lead to the Soviet-style bureaucracies in Stalinist Russia. Let us ask, to what extent is the pencil on your desk the outcome of Luther nailing his thesis to the door of the Catholic Church? How is your high school graduation the outcome of a butterfly flapping its wings on the other side of the world? The scale of this system is uncalculable by any number of human minds, 
only an artificial superintelligence would be able to plan an economy like this, and time is too short for singularitarian speculation or Yarvinist patchworks based on AI monarchies. Centrally planned economies have been a disaster, and perhaps the only function of economic policy should be to set fundamental thermodynamic limits on growth. Solar accelerationist interventionism doesn't endorse central planning to the degree that the technocrats did, see the calculation problem of Mrs. or the knowledge problem of Hayek, it's only concerned with the thermodynamic parameters in which a laissez-faire system can sustainably operate and learn to self-regulate its own existence. The real lesson or takeaway from technocracy's wisdom is not. Your economic theory must track thermodynamics. But rather. If your economic theory contradicts thermodynamics, then we can be certain it is not commensurate with reality. So could technocracy ever be done in a decentralized manner? Rather than planning the economy, could a technocracy instead concern itself with merely setting limits? Technocracy need not be a synonym for autocratic rule by scientists. A decentralized technocracy need not entail putting Stephen Pinker, Richard Dawkins, or Neil deGrasse Tyson in charge of governance just because they have lots of Twitter followers. In fact, technocracy should be less concerned with centrally planning the economy and more concerned with simply punishing the grotesque and inefficient use of resources that led to the anthropogenic climate crisis. The goal is to merely smack down irresponsible robber baron capitalists whenever they engage in the unsustainable destruction of this planet, and this is done simply by capping their extraction of raw materials, a task for which very little calculation is required. So these are just a few of the ideas that a technocracy could implement, and some combination of these ideas are being implemented right now by the descendants of technocracy movements. Exhibit A Singapore is the best example of one of the few actually existing quasi-technocracies today, with scientists and engineers holding key government positions for ensuring sustainable use of resources through energy accounting, though running in a very libertarian manner when compared to the more left-leaning technocracy movement of the 1930s. The Singaporean technocracy drafts legislation to fight grotesquely inefficient use of the very few land and natural resources the small island has. And while it's no excuse for Singapore's horrid human rights abuses, the system works out pretty well for them when it comes to ensuring their population isn't homeless and living unsustainably. Exhibit B, China, now colloquially being called a quasi-technocracy as well, has also started to blur the three barriers separating scientists, economists, and politicians. In the case of Xi Jinping, who also holds degrees in chemical engineering and economics, those three jobs are all the same career. While the technocrats were not very successful in their political campaigns, their tools for economic measurement still survive to this very day. Exergy analysis is already performed in the field of industrial ecology for efficient energy use. Exhibit C Energy accounting is also used in modern energy management systems to measure and analyze energy efficiency within an organization, for instance, corporations like Intel, which already uses said systems to track energy use. The industry term is called net exergy gain, where the inputs, outputs, efficiency, and resulting energy balance of a system are used to predict parameters for environmental impact and allocate energy limitations as needed. So how is exergy measured? Energy is neither created nor destroyed, but exergy is inherently valuable and can be destroyed when a thermodynamic process is irreversible, though exergy and energy are both still measured in joules. Similarly, exergy can also be described as embodied energy or the portmanteau energy, with units of the embodied joule or mjoule. Now, Therm Economics concerns the potential joules of exergy or free energy in a system to do useful work at a given temperature, and the reason technocrats see joules of exergy as valuable and not joules of energy is because an exergy theory of value must include waste heat in the equations while an energy theory of value doesn't necessarily do so. However, with the rise of anthropogenic climate change, this too is starting to change and waste heat is also being taken into account. The environmental Kuznets curve and stock flow consistent model are some good examples of modern therm economics addressing these concepts.
Researchers in ecological economics and environmental accounting perform exergy cost analyses in order to evaluate the impact of human activity on the current natural environment with preliminary models for the ocean and for the Earth's crust. Exergy values for human activity using this information can be useful for comparing policy alternatives based on the efficiency of utilizing natural resources to perform work. In systems ecology, we can weigh the exergy of geothermal heat, tidal energy, and solar energy against exergy derived from oil and coal energy to draft more ecologically sustainable policy. All in all, Therm economics and technocratic thought can help us derive which sources of energy can provide the most exergy, which produced commodities use more exergy than they give back, and which domestic policies utilize more exergy relative to the exergy they give back. This concerns the critical modern discourse of ERIE, which is the core legislative principle upon which a decentrally planned Danicho technocracy can be sustainably run. Pictured below an inverted banner, for a decentralized Danicho technocracy. Sector 3, OE and peer-to-peer -peer dual token cryptocurrencies. Danicho technocracy holds true to the physiocrat principles of thermodynamic value and, to some extent, even the principles of laissez-faire, and it does so not by centrally planning an entire economy but by setting the parameters for which value is defined. This inherently concerns fiat currency universal exchange value, which is built on the precarious foundation of infinite growth on a finite planet. As described earlier, the exergy of a system is the maximum useful work possible that brings the system into equilibrium with a heat reservoir. The unit of exergy or stored work is the joule, defined as a force of 1 newton over 1 meter, and after it's used, the remaining energy dissipates into entropy, usually as pollution or waste heat. What we wish to maximize by measuring exergy is OE or energy returned on invested energy. When the OE of an energy source is less than or equal to 1, that energy source becomes a net energy sink, and can no longer be used as a source of energy but might still be useful for energy storage, for example, a battery. To be considered viable as a prominent fuel or energy source a fuel or energy must have an OI ratio of at least 3 to 1 because the energy invested critically depends on technology, methodology, and system boundary assumptions. For example, photovoltaic solar panels have a mean harmonized OE between 8.7 and 34.2 with energy payback time varied from 1.0 to 4.1 years. The OE of wind turbines depends on invested energy in the turbine varies between 20 and 50 and conventional oil sources varied from around 18 to 43. So now let's ask a question, what is the minimum oil that a sustainable society must have? This important paper, Energies 2009, 2, 2547, goes into greater specifics discussing for what we call the law of minimum oil, where about a 3 to 1 return on energy investment is required to remain sustainable. This means renewables like biodiesel, with an average of below 3 to 1 OE, are actually awful because they would then have to be supplemented by fossil fuels in order to reach that 3 to 1 ratio, but the OE for traditional fossil fuels are declining to the point where it might be overtaken by the OE more sustainable sources like solar. Oil and gas have a mean OE of less than 20 to 1 now, as opposed to 30 to 1 in the 90s and 1000 to 1 in 1919, meaning it's getting harder and harder to extract from the earth. Alternatives to traditional fossil fuels such as tar sands and oil shale at 4 to 1 and 7 to 1 are also declining and will eventually hit 3 to 1. Hydroelectric power generation systems have the highest mean OE value of 84 to 1 but would require us to build all our cities near dams and this just isn't feasible, the same goes for wind power with its less impressive 18 to 1 OE, so solar might be our only chance. The average of 45 publications as low as 6 to 1 and as high as 12 to 1 put photovoltaic solar at an OE of about 10 to 1, making it possible for us to run sustainable civilizations with it. Until fossil fuels drop below 10 to 1 OE market forces can't be trusted to bring about a solar punk world anytime soon, we will have to make efforts to address our sustainability issues by perhaps returning to an atom punk world, as nuclear energy provides an average OE of 14 to 1. 
By limiting fossil fuel extraction and switching to nuclear, we can buy ourselves time for photovoltaic solar to catch up. But regulating fossil fuels with their measly 20 to 1 OE accounting for 30% of the world's energy are nothing compared to the danger of coal, which has an enormous average OE accounting for 40% of global energy. By comparison, renewables are 20% of global energy and nuclear is 10%, so the grand conclusion of therm economics is that we will need to get those first two numbers down and those last two numbers up. This may sound ideal. But how would one maximize OE? The foundations are simple, one must signal the providers of exergy to do this by using a very well-known abstract feedback messaging token called money. One solution might be to change the basis of our fiat currency, where instead of the dollar amount printed being determined by the need for Wall Street stimulus, it's instead reflective of the OE for renewable energy extraction. Fractional reserve banking originated as a means to provide loan money to people who were going to do something new and useful economically. As long as the bankers maintained a reasonable reserve as backup against too many savers wanting their funds this was an effective way to take advantage of opportunities to create new wealth. For a short period of time it looked like there was a bit more money than there really was, because savers assumed that their savings were intact or could be made whole again in a reasonable amount of time. But the bankers were not satisfied with the marginal profits they made by managing this process so they decided to lend more money and keep fewer reserves, and this is why fiat currency doesn't work. What they didn't grasp, mostly because they had long since forgotten is that money was supposed to be a token for exergy, a certificate for the ability to do work, and the tricks of the bankers only worked as long as the supply of exergy was on the increase. Financing in this manner, and other more sophisticated forms of borrowing from the future, depends entirely on economic growth rather than sustainable therm economic growth. The bad habits I refer to have to do with the false creation of more money that is not represented by an equivalent amount of exergy, and for this to be rectified economics must be grounded in thermodynamics, otherwise all these neoclassical theories of subjective value can be hand-waved away as obscurantist pseudoscience used to justify the profits of oil barons. Financing based on betting on the future was not a completely unreasonable approach while the whole system expanded, but it did create a false impression of the availability of exergy, and this impression of a fake economy growing very quickly is what led to the modern climate crisis. Ecofascists blame birth rates. Human extinctionists call our species a virus, and conservatives deny the climate crisis altogether, but nobody cares to examine the root of this entire problem which lies with the banks and the Federal Reserve showing us the illusion of civilization growing faster than it truly was, and unfortunately for the biosphere, this massive 100-year economic bubble is about to burst. So how do we create an alternative to money? What will be the replacement for this abstract feedback messaging token? The key to accomplishing this is what we call a peer-to-peer -peer energy cryptocurrency, a medium of accounting grounded in tangible physical reality rather than just online digital activity as most cryptocurrencies are. This idea comes from Michelle Borwens of the Peer-to-Peer -peer Foundation, and it aims to connect peer-to-peer -peer currency to peer-to-peer -to -peer energy production in an implicit fashion. There is an existing movement towards a localized smart grid powered economy for the populace to power their own homes sustainably using PV solar cells, but what if we can include a kind of mutual aid network, where if a house collects more solar energy than they can use, they could send the extra capacity of their grid for others to use. If the sender themselves lacks non-solar resources, they can get compensated for the energy they send to their neighbor's grid, we can call this a dual token. These dual tokens are not a fiat currency reflective of capital or the stock market, they have a fixed, exergy value measured in joules. To borrow a term from Marx, these tokens reflect the use value of energy, not the exchange value of a commodity, which grounds them in our objective capacity for production. Since supply of energy never exceeds demand for energy, anyone who needs energy can get it at its work value in joules without worrying that the price would crash and recessions would be a thing of the past. The creation of an energy-based currency sounds very authoritarian and centralized, so can technocracy ever be done in a horizontal anarchist manner? 
Perhaps it could not have been accomplished in the past, but with modern solar panel technology allowing anyone to become an energy producer the sky is the limit. All you have to do is build the energy infrastructure for which all homes are an ode on a grid with which they can send mutual aid to others. This peer-to-peer -peer anarchist grid may even lead to a slow gradual death of the utility companies, with every individual home now having the capacity to become their own small utility company at greatly reduced cost, thanks to their physical proximity to other homes. Furthermore, biofuel and biodiesel are some of the first green energy sources one can easily manufacture in their own home and this likewise allows anyone to become their own gas station or charging station without the extensive cost of a global imperialist petrol extraction infrastructure, and the biofuel you make for your neighbors can also be compensated with dual tokens. Proximity to hydropower and backyard wind farms also helps to connect localities as nodes with energy surplus with which we can more efficiently outcompete the powers that pollute our world. Midwest America has too much wind energy, Colorado has too much hydro energy, Texas has too much solar, and California has too much tidal, so why not interconnect our surplus in a grid and send it to those who need it? The idea here is that we would finally have an accurate gauge for value in an economy, as these dual tokens would represent the surplus energy in circulation and allow us to perform energy accounting and track sustainability. Based on a predictive supply demand scheduling algorithm that takes into account multiple factors such as historical peer reliability, geographical location, and unsustainable dependence on certain peers can most efficiently map producers to consumers with a blockchain database of exergy supply demand transparent and accessible by all. This blockchain database for our dual token cryptocurrency can serve as a people's energy bank that tracks the Earth's resources as the collective property of all humanity, paying the peers with newly created tokens that are equal in work value to the amount of energy stored in the global exergy inventory, giving everyone a sense of intuition as to how much energy they must limit themselves to per day for our species to live sustainably. The People's Energy Bank sells humanity's collective exergy inventory balance to peers who possess the dual tokens needed to undertake an energetically expensive venture, like setting up a factory or a space mission. The People's Energy Bank calculates a Gaussian distribution with a mean and covariance to provide an ultimate global inventory of exergy, and in exchange for dual tokens. The supply demand scheduling algorithm requests energy replenishment from peers generating the electricity, after which it produces the next cumulative forecast of inventory consumption and so on. The bank's scheduling algorithm will avoid creating unsustainable dependence on certain individual peers or certain types of energy use, thus, dual tokens are created in proportion to the increase of electric energy flow from nodes with energy surplus to nodes with energy deficit including households, charging stations, electric vehicle grid, and neighboring communities, which is what gives the tokens real value and thereby enables trade of goods and services grounded in the cost of energy it takes to produce and deliver them. Dual tokens are not created from potential exergy or speculative exergy in the future, but from actual exergy being extracted by weekly or monthly, so the currency cannot be manipulated. The idea of an energy-based economy is paradigm-shifting. Right now, people believe that the problem with the economy is that we are simply not spending enough money, which would increase GDP and cause jobs to be created, but this may inflate the fake economy even further until Mother Nature rushes in a market correction back to the true therm economic growth curve of civilization and it won't be pretty. By the false engine of money printing through the Federal Reserve the fact that GDP was growing gives us the false inference that civilization must be growing, when in fact, the therm economic growth curve lies far below the SP500, and if you wait too long to jump, the fall from the latter to the former will kill you. Only the growth of exergy can reflect a growth of real wealth. To suggest otherwise is unscientific and is only the fake growth that of the mentally masturbating minds of the neokinsons and neoclassicals. Money has no causative power whatever, and in the end the idealist conception of subjective value will one day collapse into the cold unforgiving reality of materialist thermodynamic objective value, what we should have been measuring in the first place. Thermoeconomic growth, 
in other words true economic growth, can only take place as long as there is growth in the availability of the energy, and our dollar currency must reflect this or our species will go extinct through an economy based on lies. So under therm economics, if you want your bank account to grow in value, then live more sustainably and vote for sustainable policies. Thus the inflation stimulus needed to grow Wall Street every year can only come from the Fed printing money, and to make the Fed print more money, Wall Street will have to incentivize the production of more efficient solar panels and nuclear energy. The key to accomplishing all of this is the dual token and the People's Energy Bank. In our new Anicho technocracy model, Tokens of the currency are created in proportion to the increase in the amount of electric energy flow from nodes with energy surplus to nodes with energy deficit, including households, charging stations, electric vehicle grid, and neighboring communities, which is then converted by those nodes into new work energy, which gives the tokens a real and absolute work value in spent energy. Thus we have our new exergy based cryptocurrency, we can call it X or whatever term that will be easy to remember. In summary, value in a technet is a factual metrical quantity. X, newtons, calories, joules, dynes, watts, volts, amperes, teslas, and faradays. Not fiat currency or GDP. There can be no place for subjectivity in economic evaluations and Austrian theory must be relegated to the dustbin of history. The subjective marginal utility of your breakfast has no part in the nutrition of an organism, but the thermodynamic utility does. It is exergy, not dollars, that make the world go round. We need an economic framework re-centered on ecology and its thermodynamic needs or techno-capital will perish with it. Thus, excess rather than dollars, might make for a more sustainable cryptocurrency to drive production. Sector 4, Thermonomics Conclusion all in all, the idea that thermodynamics is the root of all value in the universe seems naively simple, but neglecting to take this into account can have far-reaching consequences. So how did we get to this dystopia? Where in history did we go so wrong as to remove economics from the true metrics of value? And how can we fix modern economic theory? The first grave mistake in all modern economic systems can be traced back to Adam Smith who would eventually lead economics astray from its quasi-foundationalism in the physical sciences down a blind alley that would eventually result in the climate crisis we know today. The first mistake of the supply and demand theories of Adam Smith is that a modern economy is simply too complex and unpredictable to model as an equilibrium system, we need to integrate complex physical systems and chaos theory with non-equilibrium economics to truly have a scientific foundation for studying human behavior. The dismal science all went wrong when Adam Smith actually met with the physiocrats in France and brought these ideas to the British Empire, where he underplayed the focus on land as the source of all value, creating the labor theory of value instead, which also lead to the troubling Marxian explanation gap between labor and labor power as well as the neglected role of machinery, ignored not just by Smith, Ricardo, and Marx, but by many modern economists today. Smith and Marx mistakenly assumed that machinery contributes no surplus to the process of production, it's just surplus labor. In reality, we must consider the therm economic value of rivers, mines, and fossil fuels that allowed the industrial revolution to begin so that it can continue sustainably. To quote Marx, however useful a given kind of raw material or machine, though it may cost 150 pounds or 500 days labor, cannot under any circumstances add to the value more than 150 pounds, Marx 1867. Marx did not realize that machines can add more product value over their operational lifetime than the total value of depreciation he attributed to them. For example, the total value of sausages produced by a sausage machine over its working life might be greater than the original use value invested to thermodynamically shape the machine. Adam Smith and the classical school went wrong by not including how labor creates more outputs than inputs, thus Marx, inspired by Smith, also ignored this, which is what created the explanatory gap between his concepts of use value and exchange value. The labor theory of value, which describes the mediation between exchange value and use value, 
fundamentally leaves out the thermodynamic relations that make use value objective in the first place, an error that eventually compounded into the collapse of the post-Marxian social accounting system within the Soviet Union. What followed the Marxian and classical school was the Austrian, Keynesian, and neoclassical schools, which pushed the thermodynamic characteristics of surplus even farther away, reducing it to a byproduct of subjective exchange, making it even harder to measure the value of an economy. He neoclassical response to Marx led to no input being ranked above any other by capacity to produce output, however, there still isn't any clear concept of surplus from energy. Keynesians and Pustkinsians also had no explicit role for energy. Economics is about the transformation of labor and capital inputs into productive outputs. But all major schools of economics neglect that this transformation takes energy. Thus the true source of economic growth is not just labor and capital, but also what we call free energy or exergy. Instead of measuring our economies by technological progress, we must measure them by how efficiently we convert free energy into technological progress, otherwise we risk everything. The incentive structures must be set up not for labor like the left wants, nor for capital like the right wants, because have much of both these things, there is plenty of investment and plenty of people, what we need to create incentive structures for more energy. Mrs. and Herc bear their own responsibilities for the climagd crisis by the narrow scope of their theories. As Keane suggests, this evidenced by the neoclassical equation for production labor and capital. Y equals XL1 AXKE. Where K is capital, A is labor productivity, L is labor, and Y is economic output, through which output comes from sustainable factors of production. The post Keynesians also make these mistakes by positing Y equals minutes K slash V, or Y equals minutes Axel. Either the minimum of either capital over labor output or labor productivity times labor. So, what is the correct theory? Well, simply energy, because labor without energy is a corpse and capital without energy is a sculpture. This can be expanded to Y E equals F K E, plus L E, as in GDP is what we call useful work or Y E, which equals the function of energy harnessed by capital and the energy harnessed by labor, Y measured in megajoules while L is measured in number of unskilled workers and K by machinic output. Again, exergy is the energy available for useful work, that's why it's the exergy theory of value and not the energy theory of value. The work done by capital and labor depends on 1. Unites of L and K. 2. Flow of V harnessed by L and K. 3. Ratio, X less than 1, of X, exergy, to E, energy. 4. Efficiency, E less than 1 of use of exergy. In total, we can expand the equation to y e equals f k x x x x x x x x l x l x x l x l equals f k x x x x k x x x l x x l x l. If we rearrange Keynes propositions, we get our new theory of therm economics. y e equals k x x x x k x x x L X L X X L X L 1 A. While the physiocrats were wrong that only agriculture can capture the solar input, as the Industrial Revolution would come to show, they were still correct that this free gift of exergy was the root of all economic production, as we have now begun to see the danger of infinite growth on a finite planet caused by our theories of subjective marginal utility. After the Industrial Revolution began in England, Adam Smith noticed from the division of labor that the value of a commodity required more than just land, the value of a commodity is also equal to the quantity of labor with which one is able to transform the natural resources of the earth into value. Marx would later note the surplus of the outputs over the inputs, the profit with which he, half correctly, blames as the source of worker exploitation. The Austrian school's response to Marx led to no input being ranked above any other in its capacity to produce output because of what the Austrians called subjective value. By the time we got to the Keynesian school economics had continued to degenerate into abstraction, there was no longer a clear concept of surplus and no role for land or energy. 
the post-Keynesians rejected the substitutability of factors of production and instead favored output by fixed proportions. In post-Keynesian economic consensus, it is possible to have a zero energy input for production. Capital and labor are dead without energy content, so how exactly would post-Keynesians insist that economic production even starts to begin with? Question mark. In reality, capital and labor are simply how we transform Gibbs free energy into useful work, thus there must be a place for energy in these equations. Any theory of economics not grounded in the hard sciences is destined for disaster. The technocracy movement of the 1930s tried to create a currency based on economic production. But their movement never succeeded. One cannot add value without exergy, it must be included in the theory. Adding an energy-based production function to our economic theories would also explicitly link economics to entropy, waste, and ecological sustainability. The theories could be made even more nuanced by identifying multiple sources of energy, like renewable energy, depletion, pollution, peak resources, and energy efficiency harnessed by industry. Neoclassical theory is still tied to the production model and meritocratic income distribution with no function for energy input. In post-Keynesianism the theory of production is separate from the theory of distribution. Ever since the Industrial Revolution, machinery was overwhelmingly the main way energy was harnessed, so the labor theories of value posed by Marx and Smith are not nuanced enough and we have to start economics all over again from the beginning, returning to the physiocrats then extrapolating to land, labor, and capital as first, second, and third order exergy. The labor theory of value too must be grounded in thermodynamics, the dialectical interplay between the exergy and entropy of production. We can define the creation of value as labor power being transformed into labor. As Marx says labor power itself is energy transferred to a human organism by means of nourishing matter. Chapter 9 Marx 1867, but Marx never puts this into a systematic form thanks to his desire to maintain the labor theory of value, so this idea went unused. Post-Keynesians are even worse, because they are agnostic, they have no theory of value at all, which is paradoxically incompatible with the post-Keynesians interest in questions of methodology. This is not an argument to reject Marx and Smith but rather, to ground the labor theory of value in the actual source of value. In conclusion for therm economics, while the third and second goals of the physiocrats, the goal of a resource-based energy accounting system for human thriving and a small decentralized government, can both be revisited later through the bioeconomics and infoeconomics sections respectively, we will now shift focus to the first goal of the physiocrats. A single tax on land. This brings us to the geoeconomics section. Sector 5, Exergy and Geoeconomics The first of the three goals put forth by the physiocrats for sustainable economics was a single tax on the value of land. Quesnay described the basis of any economy as having first principles grounded in land economics, starting with the premise that all economic production is simply what he calls a gift from the sun a chain of solar input scaling from agriculture to industry. In this sense, it's safe to say Quesnay was the first solar punk economist, and his first target during the pre-revolutionary French Empire were the landlords. Quesnay and the physiocrats argued land was the source from which all value was drawn and man's labor provides the form for its circulation. This is the argument they call the free gift of nature. Quote, a farmer produces more output than input only because of this superfluidity that nature accords to him as a pure gift, Turga 1774 p9. So how does the solar input, what Quesnay called the gift, become the energy we use in our daily lives? How does that energy change hands to become labor? And better yet, how does that labor change hands to become capital? To quote Richard Cantillon, the grandfather of the physiocrat school, Land is the source from which all wealth is drawn, man's labor provides the form for its production, Cantillon 1755, p 21. Land produces 20, 50, 100 times the amount of wheat sown, depending on the fertility of the soil and industry of its inhabitants, Cantillon 1755, 
p. 170. His argument continues. Land provides the matter and labor the form, of all commodities and merchandise, and as those who work must subsist on the production of the land, it seems that some par value or ratio between labor and production of land might be found, Cantillon 1755 p. 56. The physiocrats argued profit in capitalist production was really only the rent obtained by the owner of the land on which the agricultural production took place, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels 1988, pp. 348, 355, 358. In other words, Cantillon argues the ability to own land is the necessary precursor for all economic accumulation down the line. Thus if one or their descendants are ever to become wealthy, they must own land. The air we breathe is naturally occurring, necessary for life, and available to everyone, regardless of race, gender, social class, politics, or country of origin. Nobody should have to pay to breathe air, because nobody invented air. So why can't the same be said for land? Land, like the air, is natural, necessary for life, available to everyone and invented by no one. So why do you pay to live on it? Assuming you do pay, given the current housing market you probably pay rent to a landlord instead of owning your own home. But anyway, seeing as though land is just as natural as air, why should people be allowed to skim some off the top and charge you to live on it? Owning land is comparable to a dystopian cyberpunk thought experiment about corporations owning a patch of urban airspace and forcing people to pay for the oxygen which is clearly absurd and yet a variant of this already exists. This was the great enlightenment discourse of agrarianism, and it was concerned with the unequal distribution of land as the root source of all poverty. The originally benign concept of private land ownership arose as a necessary result of the development of agricultural revolution, where everyone was a farmer so it was impossible to distinguish the possession of improvements to the land from the possession of the land itself, but with the rise of feudalism and the industrial revolution all this had changed. Those who owned the land were no longer under any obligation to improve it or contribute any economic value to society whatsoever, thus the archetypal parasite we call the landlord was born. The first great critic of landlords was surprisingly Adam Smith himself, quote the rent of land is naturally a monopoly price. It is not at all proportioned to what the landlord may have laid out upon the improvement of the land, or to what he can afford to take, but to what the farmer can afford to give. If you've ever played the board game Monopoly, once literally called the landlord's game, you understand the zero-sum game of this insight. The original purpose of the board game was not to glorify greed, the point was to point out the inherent injustice of landlords where the first few select humans get to become feudal rulers and every successive generation is predisposed to becoming enslaved when they happen upon their property. The only difference between monopoly and real life is at least monopoly was generous enough to let all players begin on an equal footing with equal wealth, whereas, in post-feudal Europe, where the nobles confiscated peasant farms, this was not the case. Land as private property under liberalism is an inherently statist social construction, first forced upon the working people of England in the early 1600s, specifically in order to enslave people who were formerly free after the collapse of feudalism. Private property forced people into rents and wage labor. The commodification of nature itself and private capture of ground rent by landlords and speculators, to which they have no more rights than any of their neighbors distorts markets, leading to real estate crashes and environmental destruction, merely aggravated by cheap credit. It also alienates the landless poor from the asset which most essential for life and production, leading to extreme wealth disparity having nothing to do with hard work or meeting needs. Land has value, but no cost of production so landlords hold the purest form of monopoly there is. Our ancestors were forced into the cities, and the common rebuttal that if you don't like capitalism you can go live in the woods was never a historical option for them, as the landlords claimed ownership of the wilderness too. The land, regardless of who owns it now, never can and never will be private property in the thermodynamic sense. Because the implications of the landlord's irresponsibility with that land lead to pollution, unsustainable resource extraction, 
and climate change. Sector 6, Agrarianism, Mutualism, and Georgism. It is with the birth of the landlord and John Locke's homestanding principle that the motivation to clean up or improve our ecology was lost, and with it, neglect for how ecology was later polluted and plundered by capital. It's with the landlord that the root of all our ecological and climatic troubles can be found, as those who don't have to live on the land they own lose all economic incentive to take care of it beyond the minimum maintenance required by market logic. But it's not just neglect and pollution that the incentive structures of land ownership create, but also poverty. The physiocrats anticipated this, and along with the ideas of Locke and Rousseau, they formed the groundwork for the post-revolutionary school of American agrarianism which officially began with the pamphlet Agrarian Justice, written by Thomas Paine in 1797. It proposed that those who possess cultivated land owe the collective community of humanity a ground rent, which thereby justifies an estate tax to fund universal old age and disability pensions with a fixed sum for all human beings upon reaching maturity. Payne proposed a detailed plan to tax landlords once per generation to pay for the needs of those who have no land, the first precursor to the modern idea of UBI he proposed that this money would be raised by taxing all direct inheritances at 10%, arguing that the earth, in its natural uncultivated state, was the common property of the human race. Payne viewed this as an extension of the God-given natural right to life, liberty, and property. Though in modern America Paine would likely be called a socialist, because as we all know, he he ha ha. Socialism is when the government does stuff. Richard Wolff, Marxist economist. By that laughable contemporary definition, allow us to introduce yet another wretched socialist, United States President Thomas Jefferson, also a founder of the agrarian school of thought who based his ideas about the budding American democracy around the notion that farmers as the most valuable citizens and the truest republicans. Jefferson too wanted to introduce a benign urban tax on wealthy bankers and industrialists to urge redistribution downward as well as tariffs on imported articles, which will hurt the wealthy rather than the poor, to quote his 1811 letter. These revenues will be levied entirely on the rich. The rich alone use imported article, and on these alone the whole taxes of the general government are levied. The poor man pays not a farthing of tax to the general government, but on his salt. Thomas Jefferson, The Writings of Thomas Jefferson Volume 13. p. 42. Jefferson's political philosophy was still extremely pro-capital, but it was built on the ideal of reducing poverty, to avoid the hardening the classes into castes. Unfortunately, Paine and Jefferson failed to articulate agrarian ideas in a way that would translate to sustainable policy, with landlords and factory owners hijacking the land to wreak havoc on the environmental landscape as well as the people, which necessitated the response of mutualism. There is an indefinite amount of humans being born on a finite planet, and this alone demonstrates the absurdity of claims to land. It would be like the biblical Adam and Eve recreationally nuking us for trespassing in the Garden of Eden just because they were there first, so what amount of humans have to be born before we recognize the absurdity of claiming to own that which is not your own body nor a product of your labor? Surely we don't consider Neil Armstrong to be the legal owner of the moon? In that sense, we are all mutualists. Mutualism developed out of anarchist thought none other than the one who coined the term anarchist. Pierre Joseph Proudhon, who is credited with formulating the first anarchist economic theory with the famous anti landlord aphorism, property is theft. Mutualism is based on a version of Adam Smith's labor theory of value whereby an individual only had a right to land while he was using or occupying it, and, should they cease to be benevolent stewards of the land's ecologically character, it reverts to unknown land. Other anarchists like Benjamin Tucker, and later, William Gillis and Kevin Carson, author of Studies in Mutualist Political Economy, saw the necessity of mutualism for preserving the incentive structure for improving and caring for the land. If the split between ownership for land and responsibility for that land should continue, the inevitable conclusion is environmental devastation. Ultimately, the failure of mutualism can be traced back to a unilateral combatant of the state without a framework for addressing capital, 
as expanded upon by Marx's poverty of philosophy as a response to Proudhon's philosophy of poverty. We will require an economic framework for understanding how the preservation of land ownership is intertwined with the state, as well as private geopolitical interests, which brings us to our definition of geoeconomics. Genomics is the study of the spatial, temporal, and political aspects of land and resources. It's important to note that we are speaking of the traditional conception of geoeconomics, not the modern conception, which is a branch of geopolitics is often attributed to geocrats like Edward Lutwak, an American economist and consultant, and Pascal Laurot, a French economist and geopolitical scientist. Nevertheless, the modern interpretation could be useful too. Lutwak lays out three principles of geoeconomics that surprisingly hold consistent with Howard Scott's technocratism. 1. Principle 1. States seek to collect as much in revenue from their land as their fiscal codes prescribe, disincentivized from letting other states tax commercial activity in the former's purview. This is a zero-sum situation. 2. Principle 2. States predominantly regulate economic activity to maximize outcomes within their own borders, rather than for a disinterested transnational purpose. 3. Principle 3, states and blocks of states strive to restrict their payouts and services to their own residents. Moreover, states design their infrastructure projects to optimize domestic utility. Under this logic, we should have transitioned to some resemblance of joyist economies a long time ago, so why have we yet to complete the transition that would optimize land taxation revenue for the states? Perhaps it's because it's not really the states that are in control but the powers of private interests pulling their strings. In addition to the physiocrats, the origins of land taxation can be traced back further to the origins of libertarian thought, as unsurprisingly, it wasn't just the far left that adopted agrarian thought but also the more moderate mutualist framework we call Jewism or Georgism, which sought to turn the motives of liquid capital against the motives of solid, land capital. Georgism, based on the writings of economist Henry George, is a market anarchist, left libertarian, or center libertarian economic framework in which people own the market value they directly create, except that things found in nature, like land and natural resources belong equally to all people. There's an equation in economics, and it's basically N plus L plus C equals P, natural resources plus labor plus capital equals production. Essentially all wealth in the history of humanity has been derived from some combination of land, labor, and the means of production. Rent comes from land, wages come from labor, and interest comes from capital. Throughout human history, the value of P in the equation gets larger and larger, but Henry George asked a simple question, why don't wages of L rise with that productivity? The obvious conclusion is that the entirety of the surplus is being hijacked by the owners N and C. Living in the United States, George didn't think much could be done about C, though he made a strong case for why N should not be treated as C tracing back the post-feudalist origins of poverty as the wrongful equating with land as just another form of capital. George cites the physiocrats and their term impotunique whereby the unique characteristics of land and rent imply that land is separate from capital and should be the shared property of humanity to some degree. The physiocrats argued that all taxes are ultimately at the expense of land rental values, so we should just formalize this system. George's solution was to champion a specific piece of political legislation that would liberate humanity from subjection to the landlord's whims. One obviously inefficient solution, as demonstrated by Mao Zedong, would be to just have the state physically confiscate people's houses and factories, for which George insisted the capitalists would just be disincentivized from building more of them, so instead George proposed just charging landlords a fee based on the value of the land. Quote. How shall we do it then? We could simply abolish private titles and declare all land public property, but I propose to accomplish the same results in a simpler easier and quieter way. Let those who will now hold land retain possession, let them even continue to call it their land. I propose that we appropriate land rent for public use through taxation this simple, yet effective solution, will raise wages, 
increase the earnings of capital, eliminate poverty, reduce crime, and provide full employment it will unleash human power, and elevate society. Henry George, Progress and Poverty. End quote. Using the ideas of Payne and Jefferson, he proposed the idea of abolishing all taxes in favor of a single tax on the value of land, what we call an LVT, land value tax or location value tax, also called a site valuation tax. In the hopes that the interests of wealthy investors seeking to avoid dividend tax and capital gains tax can be turned against the motives of landlords seeking rent. Likewise he also sought to abolish the tax on labor and income to help the working class just as much as the abolition of capital gains tax and dividend tax for business owners, which he still viewed as more economically productive than landlords. Income taxes disincentives people from starting businesses, property taxes disincentives people from improving those businesses, sales tax disincentives people from buying from those businesses payroll taxes disincentives laborers from working for those businesses, and capital gains tax disincentives people from investing in those businesses. Sure these taxes strangle the rich, but they strangle the working class, making it hard for literally everyone to get wealthier by punishing our drive to improve human life. But land tax doesn't do this, it doesn't disincentive the existence of land. Land has and always will exist whether we want it to or not, that's why it's the only logical thing to tax. Our taxes disincentive all forms of human progress and industry, meanwhile we let parasitic landlords siphon value off hard-working renters simply for existing. Land value tax removes financial incentives to hold unused land solely for price appreciation making more land available for productive uses and allowing an entire generation of young people to finally buy homes. Like many other taxes, George believed this single tax to punish inefficient use of land will have a very visible benefit to society. For instance, in New York City 10% of the land is vacant, yet the working people do not earn a living wage to afford a home in the city they help to maintain, as a wise man once said. The rent is too damn high. To use real-life examples, the current property tax system in the U.S. punishes building houses with more taxes, while rewarding the landlord's mass occupation of expensive urban land to grow low-value crops like corn and soy, thus no new homes can be built and people must pay millions of dollars to buy a house on what little urban land is not occupied by cheap crops. Even when the landlords do build houses on the land, they build low-quality housing and slums to save on property taxes, because again, property taxes focus on the house value rather than the land value. The current incentives push farmers to have as few quality buildings as possible on their land, but what if we do incentivize them to build houses on it? Under land value tax there would be no taxes on anything except the land itself, so there is no punishment for landlords building houses or improving the farmland only a punishment for landlords doing nothing with that valuable space. If we had land value tax, when cities would be allowed to rezone land until the landlords consider it too expensive to hold, thereby selling it to developers who will actually come in and improve the land, building houses for an entire homeless generation. Likewise the income from the land value tax will be collected by the cities themselves who can use it to build roads and parks, rather than the landlords who don't have to use the income to improve the property unless they want to. After instating land value tax, whatever land that the landlords abandon and what non-landlords refuse to buy can be left to nature and wildlife, who have been left at the mercy of landlords renting their property out as landfills. All at the same time, land value tax will stop market speculation, leave more land to ecological, give young people a chance to buy homes and incentivize farmers to grow quality food rather than just cheap crops like corn and soy. Currently, there is a net transfer of incomes from those that own little to no land by value relative to the taxes they pay, toward those for whom the opposite is true. In somewhere like the UK, out of 26 million households, only 7 million are occupied. Owner-occupiers consume an extra 12 million bedrooms compared to those that rent which is apparently what neoclassical market logic supposedly considers to be efficient. 
Similarly the Canadian and Australian housing markets have also been subject to excessive money laundering and speculation such that you can expect to pay a million dollars for a poorly maintained crack house in downtown San Francisco. The tax shift to land value tax would allow for more optimal allocation of existing housing stock, eliminating excessive vacancy to house the homeless as well as an entire generation of young people living with their parents. Land value tax can also be instituted by developing nations to help fight neo-colonialism and exploitation, as land is the only commodity with inherent value that cannot be permanently removed from the country by imperialists. Sector 7 Urban Planning and Land Value Taxation LVT. So why a tax on land and not anything else? Is this just dystopian neoliberalism with extra steps? George chose the land tax because he believed it was the only thing one can tax without it being circumvented by a tax loophole. First off, the land value tax is only an efficient tax to collect because unlike labor and capital, land cannot be hidden or relocated. When you tax marginal income then entrepreneurs move to countries where those taxes are lower, if you tax wages then workers go to work in countries where those taxes are lower, if you tax capital gains people will invest in countries where those taxes are lower, and if you tax property then people will build houses in countries where those taxes are lower. However, if you tax land, the land isn't going to move. It's the only static part of the economy that can't be smuggled out. What exactly is Porky supposed to do in order to avoid this land tax? Fly bucketfuls of American dirt to his Swiss bank account on the other side of the world? Hoard a trillion megatons of dirt in the Cayman Islands? Perhaps as one small exception, the land value tax could have a subset called a Pigovian tax a tax on negative externalities on water and pollution that incentivize clean energy solutions as the one allowable method of legitimate tax evasion. It's a complementary pollution tax, or negative land value tax, for degrading the shared value of the natural commons. In addition to curbing climate change, approximately one-third of U.S. GDP traces back to land value in some form or another, so if we tax this, it would provide enough government revenue to get rid of almost every other tax. This is an ad valorem levy on the unimproved value of land, and unlike property taxes, it disregards the value of buildings, personal property, and human components to the land, as not to disincentive the production of those things. A land value tax is generally favored by economists as, unlike other taxes, it does not cause economic inefficiency and it tends to reduce inequality. This is not going to skyrocket home prices, it will tank home prices because having empty homes would also be disincentivized by the land value tax. In fact, it could solve homelessness because there already are more homes than there are people. A positive relationship of land value tax and market efficiency is predicted by economic theory and has been observed in practice. Fred Fold very stated that the tax encourages landowners to develop vacant and underused land or sell it. He claimed that because land value tax deters speculative land holding, dilapidated inner city areas return to productive use, reducing the pressure to build on undeveloped sites to reduce slumland. The rent charged for land may also decrease as a result of efficiency gains if speculators stop hoarding unused land. Real estate bubbles direct savings towards end seeking rather than dispersing capital to other investments, which directly contributed to the 2008 financial crisis. Meanwhile, land value tax reduces the speculative element in land pricing, thereby leaving more money for capital diversified investment and reduces financial crashes. Land value tax generally removes incentives to misuse real estate, altogether reducing the vulnerability of economies to property bubbles and their inevitable collapse. Because land isn't supplied by human input, the land value tax will elicit no supply response from the market, in other words, the land value tax and rent from land provide the same circulation of value, the only difference is who collects. Landowners are already charging as much as the market will allow, so again, land isn't going to disappear if you tax it. Now one might ask, what level of violent revolution would be required to implement such a system? Perhaps none. 
the best part of land value taxes it can be done whether neoliberalism exists or not, as literally the only people who don't benefit from it are a specific subset of capitalists, the landlords. While Marx famously criticized George for not trying to correct the underlying sickness caused by capital and just treating the symptoms, at least the land value tax did seem to soften the blow in countries around the world that have applied it. In fact, this is one libertarian idea that was highly supported by the left wing, from Albert Einstein, to Bertrand Russell, to Martin Luther King Jr., to Christian anarchist Leo Tolstoy, who deeply admired Henry George's solution and incorporated it into his works. Quote, the only indubitable means of improving the position of the workers, which is at the same time in conformity with the will of God. It consists in the liberation of the land from its user patient by the landlords. The most just and practicable scheme in my opinion is that of Henry George, known as the single tax system. Leo Tolstoy. End quote. Hell, the land value tax was even advocated by Milton Friedman of all people. There appears to be almost a universal consensus from left to right on land value tax as efficiency. We, we have to recognize that, uh, that uh, we mustn't hope for a utopia that is unattainable. I would like to see a great deal less government than we have, activity than we have now. But I do not believe that we can have a situation in which we don't need government at all. We do need to provide for certain essential government functions, the police function, the national defense function, function of preserving law and order, of maintaining a judiciary. And so the question is, which are the least bad taxes? And in my opinion, the, and this may come as a shock to some of you, the least bad tax is the property tax on the unimproved value of land, the Henry George argument from many, many years ago. What almost all schools of economics can agree on is that the current tax system, through income tax and sales tax which hurt the ecosystem the most, are disincentivizing that actual value that labor creates in society, while the absence of taxation on unimproved land allows landlords to privatize almost all their gains while having to contribute nothing to the economy in return if not polluting the land that gave them this wealth. George believed in the inverse, though he never actually advocated a land tax as the name suggests, but a land fee, a license to use the collective geography of terror, the price of which would be determined by the land's abundance of natural resources, locational advantage, and the privilege to exclude others from locations. Land in the big cities is worth a lot, and landowners there will have a higher fee but land in the middle of nowhere is worth very little, so farmers won't be affected all too much. In a strange twist of irony, George is advocating that landlords pay rent for the right to make everyone else pay rent, quote. The single tax in short would call upon individuals to contribute to public revenues not in proportion to what they produce or accumulate but in proportion to the value of the natural opportunities they hold it would thus solve the labor problem. Henry George, Progress and Poverty, or Kate, Chapter 3. End quote. As justification George argues that the value of urban real estate is created by the masses who move there, not by the landlord, thus the people in these cities should receive a share of the gains rather than all the benefit going to the landlord who benefits by mere good fortune of their geographic holdings. It's not landowners but laborers who do the work that makes the land worth more than it was yesterday. Is it not us who build the schools, hospitals, and factories near the land that eventually gives it value in the first place? The land value tax would not be a tax on constructed property like houses or factories, but a tax on unimproved land such that the owners would be incentivized to take care of it and perhaps even improve it, to quote Henry George. The tax upon land values, is therefore, the most just and equal of all taxes. It falls only upon those who receive from society a peculiar and valuable benefit, and upon them in proportion to the benefit they receive. It is the taking by the community, for the use of the community, of that value which is the creation of the community. It is the application of the common property to common uses. When all rent is taken by taxation for the needs of the community, 
then will the equality ordained by nature be attained. No citizen will have an advantage over any other citizen save as is given by his industry, skill, and intelligence, and each will obtain what he fairly earns. Then, but not till then, will labor get its full reward, and capital its natural return. Henry George, Progress and Poverty, Book 8, Chapter 3. End quote. George's geoeconomics define land as any natural resource which is inherently limited in supply yet can generate economic rent, as with depots of natural resources, raw material, water, or urban locations. Unlike Proudhon's philosophy of poverty, George's 1879 work Progress and Poverty sought to have private interests to combat the landlords rather than insurrectionary forces uniquely integrating libertarian ideas of economic efficiency with left-wing mutualism or social justice. George also advocates the land value tax as a possible solution to public debt and poverty, where whatever is left of the land value tax revenue after the government is fully funded, should be split up and given back to the people equally as a universal basic income. This means those poorer in society benefit more from this citizen's dividend than the rich. Lastly, landowners who simply sit on land without using it will be forced to pay the land value tax anyway, and if they aren't making money off of this land, it will incentivize them to sell the land to whoever can make better use of it. Ultimately, joyists interpret the Lockean proviso and the law of equal liberty to mean that exclusive land ownership beyond one's equal share of aggregate land value necessarily restricts the freedom of others to access the ecology. In order to promote freedom and minimize waste, landlords should surrender the rental value of the land to which they hold legal title to the community as a subscription fee for the privilege to exclude others from the site. So, is Joism, Georgism solar punk? Is it even punk at all? How exactly does geoeconomics help to solve the climate crisis? Naturally, the benefit this would have for the environment is almost incalculable. First off, the value of the area that a landlord has polluted determines how much they will have to pay, as land value tax is a progressive tax based on the unimproved value of the land. Which in the polluter's case would be a negative balance they will have to pay off. We can expect Exxon, Chevron, Shell, BP, and Arca to fight land value tax to the death. An outcome to which I'm sure the green capitalists in Silicon Valley would happily oblige. Georgism is not an optimistic Marxist revolution, it will be enforced by capitalists on other capitalists who are merely greedy in a different way. Land value tax is arguably an eco tax above all else because it discourages the waste of prime locations, which are a finite resource. Land value tax is arguably an eco tax above all else, because it discourages the waste of prime locations, which are a finite resource. When exploring the impact of land value tax on the environment, George specifies that the land value tax also extends to the oceans and the air, so polluters would have to pay for destroying the collective ecosphere, and this could serve as an excellent deference to slow climate change in a world where neoliberalism is still the dominant ideology. This means the end of irresponsible action concerning oil spills, deep sea drilling, and the Great Pacific garbage patch. Natural resources are inherently finite and we aren't going to get more of them, but we can use them up, and the point of the land value tax is to make people use these finite resources as efficiently as possible and punish the irresponsibility of those who don't. On top of this, the land value tax de-incentivizes the creation of slums, disincentivizes landfills, disincentivizes fracking, disincentivizes chemical pollution, all while improving the beauty and quality of our cities. Urban planners have also argued that land value tax is an effective method to promote transit-oriented development for the construction of high-speed rail. It would also effectively end suburban sprawl, long commute times, and incentivize city planners to build upward toward cyphers car colleges, rather than outward to the generic cookie-cutter suburbs we have now. This may sound great in theory. But how would legislative policy for Joism work? Polluters are taxed by their carbon footprint on the land, but how do you calculate that? This can be tricky to count, 
but fortunately for us businesses are already assessed of their value of their assets by the government anyway, so why not extend this exact same government infrastructure for measuring the pollution or unimproved value of land? Land value inspector would be a good job for all those filthy parasites some. I mean, landlords, that the land value tax puts out of business. The land value tax is based on what tenants are willing to pay and not raised or lowered at the landlord's will, thus citizens will be allowed to move freely from place to place without the possibility of rising rents impeding on one's decision to move. Of course, land value tax is not without its critics, the most notorious being Anicho capitalist economist Murray Rothbard who claimed the land value tax will fail because humans will never be able to assess the value of land better than Wall Street can. As the supply of land is fixed, the burden of the tax falls entirely on the landowner. There is no change in the rental price or quantity transacted, and no deadweight loss. Most taxes distort economic decisions and suppress beneficial economic activity and land value tax is payable regardless of how well land is actually used. Rothbard argues there is no more efficient way to appraise the land than market logic, but that's a very easy claim to challenge. The distribution of humanity throughout the land itself literally is the pricing mechanism for the land tax such that the Austrian school's famous economic calculation problem doesn't apply as it would to commodities. All you'd need are some decent demographic maps or a basic census, it wouldn't require a large bureaucracy to get a reasonable appraisal for land at all. Another way to do it would be to simply have land auctions where the owner is the one willing to pay the highest land value tax for it, because human migration itself already is the free market for land, wherever people like to move determines the value of the land, it does not require Wall Street to calculate. This is where the technology comes in, as pre-existing infrastructures like Zillow and Zolo can be used to help appraise the value of land in comparison to the property built on it. Additionally, Rothbard also criticized the land value tax as theft, to which one might ask Rothbard if he'd reconsider should he find himself awakened from a plane crash on a deserted island, a circle drawn in the sand around his once unconscious body, and the other survivors charging him blowjobs to use their private property beyond the circle. From a humanist standpoint, this would be analogous to the history of the feudal peasantry whose descendants did not get the same leg up that descendants of the feudal lords did. Draconian proprietarianism is a harsh mistress, so capitalists like Rothbard could instead just think of this critique of landlords not as an attack on capitalism, but just the last vestige of feudalism that has yet to be wiped away. To quote H. G. Brown. Place 100 men on an island from which there is no escape and whether you make one of these men the absolute owner of the other 99, or the absolute owner of the soil of the island, will make no difference either to him or to them. In the one case, as the other, the one will be the absolute master of the 99, his power extending even to life and death. For simply to refuse them permission to live upon the island would be to force them into the sea. Sector 8, Joe Economics Conclusion So now the generic question is, if Joeism is so great, then why aren't there any Joist countries? While George's failed presidential campaign ended his influence in the public sphere, some Georgist ideas survive to this day. Exhibit A, in Singapore, probably the most famous case, all of the land is publicly owned by the citizenry of Singapore, and those with the most valuable land pay upwards of 16% revenue in land value tax, funds used to provide housing for the homeless. In Singapore 4 million people rent the land on 99 year leases, no private landlords required, it's a country where everyone is a tenant of the biosphere. And understandably so, because this tiny island nation has limited space so mother nature has dragged the neoliberal government kicking and screaming in to regulate their own pollution, trash, and use of cars. This is also why homelessness is virtually non-existent despite Singapore being one of the most radically capitalist governments on the planet, but note this applies to the native population not the non-citizen migrant workers who are horribly abused when it comes to living space. In fact, Singapore values their land so much, the quasi-fascist Singaporean government will literally cane you if you drop a joint or spit your gum on it.
Exhibit B, Denmark has implemented geoeconomic theory to a lesser degree, with a 3% tax on all land worth over $343,000 American. It's called Grundskold or Grand Duty, which has been slowly adopted by their tax system. And seems to encourage efficient use of their very limited land mass. Exhibit C, oddly enough, there was once potential in the United States. Several small utopias with geoeconomic principles were also initiated during the heyday of the philosophy's popularity, two former Georgist communes that still exist in America are Arden, Delaware, founded in 1900, and Fairhope, Alabama, founded in 1894. Exhibit D, less known success stories are the Baltic states. Land value taxation is also currently implemented throughout many municipalities in Estonia and Lithuania though not at the national level. Exhibit E, the most famous example of successful joist legislature is probably Taiwan, where land value taxes and land value increment taxes accounted for 8.4% of total government revenue, so it's not like this is some fringe utopian economic theory that can't be implemented in the real world. It already has. Various organizations still exist that continue to promote the ideas of Henry George. The Land and Liberty Policy Organization established since 1894 is the longest-lived Georgist project in history. Likewise the Henry George School of Social Science in New York has been around since 1932, offering courses, seminars, and publishes research on the geoeconomics paradigm. This sounds all well and good, but isn't land value tax theft for lack of a better word? Rather than just hand wave away property as a spook, we may revisit the modern definition of theft, partly formulated by John Locke 400 years ago. Joists often dispute the received interpretation of Locke's homestead principle outlined in his second treatise of government as concerning the justice of initial acquisition of property in land, opting instead for a view ostensibly more compatible with the proviso which considers Locke to be describing the process by which property is created from land through the application of labor to the natural world. Here is where we will critique Locke's homestanding principle. Nearly every piece of land in the world can probably trace its roots back to violent force, so how can anything be legitimately owned it was at one point stolen? If you own a stolen Mona Lisa it's not yours just because you paid for it, likewise the same can be said for land. The only thing that is legitimately yours is your labor, and Locke said that when you mix this labor with the natural world you have created property, and this is also yours except this is not exactly what modern landlords do. Today's landlords aren't farmers. They just hold vast tracts of land and wait for it to appreciate like dragons on a mountain of gold. The land value tax is the only thing that would incentive them to sell it to someone who actually will do something with it. What actually makes ownership valid in modern neoclassical economics will get us into countless ecological contradictions if we accept Locke's homestanding principle, which may have made sense during his time but not during ours. The landlords never worked on the land, produced the land, nor helped the land come into being by taking risks or formulating ideas, they just inherited or bought it at some point. Nevertheless, Henry George and geoeconomics still face severe criticism today, mostly not from the right, but rather from the far left. Following Karl Marx's response to Henry George, Marxians today argue improvements to the land still shift tenants' demand curve to the right and landlords benefit from price competition among tenants, such that the OVT only reduces the viability of land as an investment by title holders. It is not a permanent solution to post industrial alienation from nature, and more drastic changes will needed to be implemented to save the acceleration of technological progress. For this we will require a critique of wage labor and the commoditization of our ecology, best explained through the higher order discourse of bioeconomics. Sector 9, Post-Scarcity and Bioeconomics Let us first address the consensus that technology and energy has often been thought of as apolitical, neither good nor evil and relatively distinct from the political economy, and yet, we find the discourses of technology's economic impact overlap constantly with the environmental impact amongst the most vulnerable in society. This is the discourse in which anti-SIF thought dominates consistently over pro-SIF thought. 
proposed anti-SIF solutions for the preservation of life on this planet range from Jensenian anarchist environmentalism as insurrection for a sustainable society, Katzinsky and Luddism for Neolithic pre-industrial society, Evolian traditionalism for a pre-enlightenment feudal society, Zertzanian primitivism for an even more radical Paleolithic pre-agricultural society. Malthusian ecofascism with an emphasis on population control of the developing world, and if we dare to go even further, Metzian voluntary extinctionism to gradually eradicate the human species in the name of saving other species. All these Faustian solutions, in one form or another, obfuscate their hidden agenda for insurmountable sacrifice of human life with the impending destruction of the global agro industrial food distribution infrastructure if not an apologetic advocacy of outright genocide. Though, there also exists an array of underdog progsif solutions within environmental discourse that could be considered Promethean rather than Faustian, such as the solar punk communalism of post-scarcity anarchist Murray Bookchin, the technocratic Venus project of archaeofuturist engineer Jix Fresco, or the sustainable technogaeanism of socialist transhumanist James Hughes, some of which reject the traditional distinction between man and nature altogether. Returning to the thermodynamic theory of value, the physiocrats viewed the production of goods and services as equivalent to the consumption of the agricultural surplus, since human or animal muscle provided the main source of power, as well as all energy derived from the surplus, originally from agricultural production. This was what inspired Adam Smith to draft his famous labor theory of value in The Wealth of Nations. Karl Marx today faces severe criticism for his conception of the labor theory of value derived from Adam Smith. But what's rarely criticized is the Austrian subjective utility theory of value which possesses even less nuance and more danger to ecological sustainability. Hours of labor is not a difficult variable to measure. But do you measure the subjective utility theory of value? How do you measure how much pleasure an ice cream brings to 7 billion different people with different wants and desires? One may posit that a bioeconomic theory based on thermodynamics would be easier to defend than one based on subjective marginal utility. Let's first distinguish between exchange value, or subjective value, and use value, or objective value. Any commodity, product, or service has both an exchange value and a use value, in other words, the way in which an object is valuable to the human mind versus the way in which they are intrinsically valuable in the context of thermodynamics and entropy. A materialist realizes it is not just the human mind that determines the value of things as with idealists, because there is such a thing as value without human beings present to enjoy it, life may still exist long after humanity is gone. This makes the subjective marginal utility theory of value what scientists call an observer-dependent phenomenon. Meanwhile the labor theory of value is an observer-independent phenomenon, it is post-humanist rather than humanist, concerning exergy, the thermodynamic term for stored free energy able to do work, which is completely independent of human perception, and still valuable without a perceiver, as it concerns the mechanisms by which perceivers can even exist. Let us consider two rebuttals. The mud pie and the water bottle in the desert. Fallacy number one, mud pies, the most common misunderstanding of the labor theory is the famous mud pie argument, where the opposition conflates the price of one's labor with its objective thermodynamic worth. Although, what they misunderstand is that worth is objective value, whereas price is subjective value. The mud pie argument says the labor theory of value is wrong because even if I were to expend 10,000 hours of labor making hundreds of mud pies, it will not make the mud pies more valuable as long as there is no one to buy them. What the mud pie argument fails to grasp that this mud pie labor still requires an objective amount of physical force measured in newtons, an objective amount of work applied by the worker measured in joules and an objective amount of power from the sun to fuel the whole system, measured in watts. When Marx said he wanted to create a scientific socialism, perhaps he meant this very literally, as in a conception of economics based on observer-independent phenomena. Solar acceleration aims to expand on Marx's humanist theory of value into a post-humanist way of describing the same theory via thermodynamics. Fallacy number 2, Water Bottles 
Another misunderstanding is the famous water bottle in the desert argument, whereby a water bottle worth $1 can be sold for $100 to a man dying of thirst in the desert, because in that particular situation the water bottle is worth more. This again confuses the quantitative with the qualitative, because the labor theory of value doesn't depend on perception, there is an objective amount of water in the bottle that took an objective thermodynamic input to create. The concept of thermodynamics, not desire, is what makes the water valuable, because the contents of the water bottle can still be used to do an objective amount of chemical reactions in many other contexts, and this is why it is a mistake to conflate price with value. The only amount of value added to the water bottle by the seller was the mouth labor it took to swindle them out of a hundred dollars, and this is hardly the basis for a theory of sustainable economics. Marx called this the MCM prime circuit, his basis for the theory of exploitation, whereby objective value can be stolen from one human by another, if and only if they convert it into subjective value first, then convert it back into objective value later. This is not to say that there aren't legitimate critiques of the labor theory of value, because this theory, like subjective marginal utility, can be anthropocentric in its own way by not grounding surplus human labor in science. This brings us to bioeconomics. Biodiversity does have objective value that is not factored into any theory of economics, and Marxism too, interprets the world through a humanist lens, which itself bears partial responsibility for the climate crisis. In defense of Marx, the labor theory doesn't mean labor is the source of all value, in fact Marx actually admits that nature is the source for all value, it's just that labor is required to transform that nature into anything useful, but one might ask Marx. Useful to whom? Marx was a humanist, but we might ask. Is the not value within the non-human aspects of the biosphere or value within the meteorological subcomponents of humans themselves? The capacity of DNA to create a flowering of anti-entropic potential within the kingdom of life. Are we wise to cut down rainforests just because they are temporarily useful to humans for manufacturing commodities? How does one discern the value of an ecosystem? Sector 10, VSL and VOL. Bioeconomics is the study of the coevolution and spatio-temporal interdependence of human economies with natural ecosystems, including but not limited to environmental justice, intergenerational equity, and sustainable development. It has its origins with economist Sergei Podolinsky, who attempted to theorize a labor theory of value based on biologically embodied energy. To revisit the aforementioned equation of N plus L plus C equals P. Bioeconomists propose adding bio capital to the typical capital asset analysis of natural resources, labor, and financial capital. Thus giving us the new equation. B plus N, plus L plus C equals P. To accomplish this a simple circular flow of income diagram can replace in ecological economics by a more complex flow diagram reflecting the input of solar energy as well as outputs like pollution or waste and how those will recursively boomerang to impact bio-capital input. This concept of bio-capital or more formally, the environmental source function, is defined as the potential of an environment to provide ecological services, which is vulnerable to depletion as pollution accumulates. The sink function describes an environment's ability to absorb and render harmless waste and pollution before it starts to deplete bio-capital. When waste output exceeds the limit of the sink function, long-term damage to bio-capital occurs, such that it will be able to contribute increasingly less to production. For example, while a forest is capable of reducing flooding and sequestering carbon for climate control, as well as providing habitats for species that can have medical research applications, this forest is subject to pollution from harmful chemicals, such that it will be less capable of doing all these things in the future. So what exactly does unsustainability cost when we factor bio-capital into the equation? In 1997, Robert Costanza, distinguished professor of sustainability at Portland University, was the first to estimate the worldwide worth of ecosystem services, bringing new attention to the field of ecosystem valuation. 
he and his colleagues calculated that such services were worth $33 trillion annually, $44 trillion adjusted for inflation. Initially published in the scientific journal Nature, the article concluded on $33 trillion with a range from $16 trillion to $54 trillion. Meanwhile global GDP was $27 trillion, which is to say the environment is quite literally worth more to humanity than our current civilization is to ourselves. Following the estimate, a 2007 summit of G13 nations agreed to both publicly call begin undertaking the calculation of global ecosystem benefits, conservation costs, and the opportunity costs of developing such ecosystems, leading to the founding of TEEB, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity. TEEB later found that ecosystem services start at roughly $100 hectare year for open ocean, and top off to more than $1,000,000 hectare year for the most lucrative coral reefs. In this sense, Bioeconomics generally rejects the reductionist view of thermeconomics that growth in the energy supply is related directly to well-being, and the geoeconomics view that all wealth comes from land, because even within those frameworks we can conclude there is great value to be found in biocapital and biodiversity, which we have now closely linked to our quality of life. So, how can we add to thermeconomics and geoeconomics to incorporate ecological capital? What is the value of an ecosystem in relation to the value of human labor? How does it compare to the value of a human life? How can solar ecclorationism become truly post-humanist? Economists have recently coined the term value of life or volume to refer to the economic benefit to avoiding one human fatality, and this greatly concerns the discourse of environmental justice as well as the way we believe the trade of human lives for commodities is a good investment value of life is a statistical term, the cost of reducing the average number of deaths by one. In industrial nations, the justice system considers a human life priceless, thus illegalizing any form of slavery, meaning humans cannot be bought at any price. However, with a limited supply of resources or infrastructural capital and available skill at hand, it is, obviously, impossible to save every human life, so some trade-off must be made. And if the trade offs are to maximize the human lives saved, as consequentialists, we must weigh the act of saving lives against circumstances of taking lives or producing lives. There is no standard concept for the value of a specific human life in economics. However, when looking at risk reward trade offs that people make with regard to their health, economists often consider the value of a statistical life, known as VSL. Note that the VSL is very different from the value of an actual life. It is the value placed on changes in the likelihood of death, not the price someone would pay to avoid certain death. In the humanist conception, it can still be useful for incorporating life extensionism and transhumanist aspirations for immortality into bioeconomic theory. The concept of VSL is best explained by way of an example. From the EPA's website. Suppose each person in a sample of 100,000 people were asked how much he or she would be willing to pay for a reduction in their individual risk of dying of 1 in 100,000, or 0.001%, over the next year. Since this reduction in risk would mean that we would expect one fewer death among the sample of 100,000 people over the next year on average, this is sometimes described as one statistical life saved. Now suppose that the average response to this hypothetical question was $100. Then the total dollar amount that the group would be willing to pay to save one statistical life in a year would be $100 per person times 100,000 people, or $10 million. This is what is meant by the value of a statistical life. This again emphasizes that VSL is more of an estimate of willingness to pay for small reductions in mortality risk rather than how much a human life is worth. Measuring government spending to see how much is spent to save lives, we can estimate the average individual VSL as a method of calculation. The United States government does not have an official value of life threshold, but different values are used in different agencies. It might be that the government values lives quite highly or that calculation standards are not applied uniformly. 
using the EPA as an example, the agency uses estimates of how much people are willing to pay for small reductions in their risks of dying due to adverse health conditions from environmental pollution in their cost-benefit analyses. We must then ask, if lifespan as a variable should be factored into the valuation our currency? Sector 11, Exergy Tokens and Life Extension Modern healthcare systems have long been characterized by the fact that it's bad business to cure diseases, and more profitable to just treat the symptoms with expensive pharmaceutical drugs. It's a system that disincentivizes research on radical life extension or medical procedures to meaningfully reverse the aging process, as biogerontologist Aubrey de Grey would put it. So how exactly would we manipulate the currency to incentivize this? Value of life estimates are frequently used to estimate the benefits added due to a new policy or act passed by the government. One example is the six year retroactive study on the benefits and costs of the 1970 Clean Air Act in the period from 1970 1990. This study was commissioned by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Office of Air and Radiation, and Office of Policy, but was carried out by an independent board of public health experts economists, and scientists headed by Dr. Richard Schmelenzi of MIT. On conducting the benefit-cost analysis, we can measure each dollar value of an environmental benefit by estimating how many dollars a person is willing to pay in order to decrease or eliminate a current threat to their health, otherwise known as their willingness to pay, WTP. The WTP of the U.S. population was estimated and summed for separate categories including mortality chronic bronchitis, hypertension, and strokes. Thus, the individual WTPs were added to get the value of a statistical life for each category considered in the valuation of the Act's benefits. Compiling data from individuals The WTP estimates from risk compensation demanded in the current labor market and was averaged to find a singular VSL with respect to fatal occupational injuries collected by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. For example, the valuation estimates used for mortality were divided by the typical life expectancy of each survey sample in order to get a dollar estimate per life year lost or saved which was discounted with a 5% discount rate. Using these estimates, the paper concluded that the benefits, ranging from $5.60 to $49.4 trillion, of implementing the Clean Air Act from 1970 to 1990 outweighed the economic costs of $523 billion in 1990 dollars. Now, the external cost of climate policy is largely determined by impacts on mortality rate, and this might make us want to revisit Therm Economics and the technocrats' proposal of transitioning the dollar into a dual token currency based on available exergy, but this removes the bioeconomic element entirely. Instead of a dual token based on the amount of sustainable energy we have available, we might instead opt for a bio token, which incorporates VSL into the calculation by a ratio of exergy that could be extracted and the amount human mortality rate it would cost to extract this. What this all means is that in order to make your bank account grow you can do one of two things. Either fight for a society in which more energy can be extracted without harming human life expectancy namely this would be the direct energy of the sun. Or option 2, you cannot increase your energy extraction at all but then will have to extend human lifespan and improve the bio-capital on planet, which I'm sure transhumanists, immortalists, and environmentalists will very much appreciate. By transitioning away from an economy based on GDP growth to one based on an energy-backed currency factoring average human lifespan. Those who wish to increase the value of the currency they hold are presented with an ultimatum between either 1, improving climate sustainability or 2, extending human, ecological life expectancy. Either way, it's a win-win. The film In Time starring Justin Timberlake contains elements for this strange kind of lifespan-based economy, and bioeconomics would be creating something more practically analogous to this except the human lifetime would be collectively pooled as the exchange rate of a currency in ratio of exergy to lifespan, rather than hoarded by an elite few, as shown in the film. Returning to the original goals of Marx, this new reconceptualization of value will also have a significant impact on his critique of alienation.
Sector 12, Bioeconomics Conclusion How exactly would bioeconomics improve the biological beyond just an increase in lifespan? How will this improve our social reality? How is it punk? The key lies in how a firm economically defined theory of value may reverse the atomization of the workers, as most social unrest can be traced back to Marx's four kinds of alienation which are present under the current neoclassical market incentives. The first kind of alienation is the alienation of laborers from other laborers. Under the subjective utility theory laborers all seek what benefits them individually, wages, rather than what benefits them mutually, which would be a longer life expectancy and a more sustainable biosphere. This is why it is necessary to redefine our economic theory of value, such that we are no longer fighting over the table scraps. The second kind is the alienation of laborers from the products they make, which occurs when laborers make products that don't fully belong to them, but if the profits are invested in a collective goal toward higher life expectancy and a more sustainable biosphere we can work toward solving this. Right now most workers in the world can't even afford the products they're making, and this is because we still make decisions solely based on whether or not it's good for GDP rather than whether or not it's good for human lifespan. Redefining the growth of an economy by the production of bioeconomic assets that benefit ecological progress is crucial to solving the climate crisis. The third kind is the alienation of laborers from the act of laboring, meaning laborers are coerced or forced into not working on their own terms. They not working because working is the expression of some need but because it's a means to getting what they need through attaining wages. It also occurs when they can't decide how the product is sold or applied. So for instance, you have to work a job you don't like, making money for somebody else, or accept starvation. Marx thought what you're experiencing there is alienation from the act of laboring. Redefining value in an objective thermodynamic framework would ensure that regardless of what kind of labor is chosen by the laborer, it can at least be measured and recognized by the laborer to inform their choice. The fourth kind is the alienation of laborers from their gatungsks, species being, where you don't get to do what you want to do in life, instead you are forced to generate profit for somebody else or you starve. You do discrete, separate jobs, rather than work on what you want to because that's the way profits are more easily generated. You'll do this for hours not set by you and for most of the time that makes up your life, rather than direct your life the way you want it to go. Marx thought there was some separate human nature independent of our socio-historical circumstances. The Gatungsks, which capitalism corrupts and turns against our own interests such that we don't get to live our lives the way we see fit, and unfortunately this problem of a cyberpunk dystopia, is not something that bioeconomics can solve on its own. The alienation here comes from a post-industrial information economy. It is bound to create contradictions as the acceleration of techno-capital intensifies class struggle. When Marx speaks of contradictions he isn't referring to logical contradictions like living dead or four-sided triangle, rather, he speaks of Hegelian antagonisms, opposing forces that will one day clash and resolve themselves. Like poverty in first world countries amidst great wealth, or homeless people camping outside empty homes, or robots taking all our jobs somehow makes us have to work more, rather than fewer, hours or global mass starvation in the age of automated factory farming. For those unfamiliar with basic Marxist theory, contradictions are simply about how outdated economic systems fall and give rise to new ones. Exhibit A, the contradiction in ancient Roman imperialism was the exponentially increasing demand for more slaves and the need to conquer new lands to replace the slaves dying of old age which stretched their military to collapse and a new system was born. Feudalism. Exhibit B. The next system, feudalism, encountered contradictions between phenomena like war or the Black Plague wiping out too many of the laborers and leaving too many of the merchant class alive, which led to the rise of investment and the specialization of labor which came to undermine feudalism. This gave rise to capitalism, the Renaissance, the scientific revolution and urbanization, all of which are the sworn enemies of monarchism, traditionalism, and theocracy.
evidence as to why Curtis Mencius Moldgbugyavin's idea of neo-reaction is doomed to fail, as NRX combining a futuristic industrial society with feudal traditionalism is a system that, by definition, must collapse into a either the former or the latter. Fascism is the path of collapse into the latter. Exhibit C, the next system, which we are in right now, capitalism, has its own contradictions and they are even more numerous than the previous two systems. Alienation is intertwined with contradiction, and it will be the task of solar acceleration to alleviate this insofar as it continues to sabotage production. David Harvey wrote a book, The Seventeen Contradictions of Capitalism, a taxonomy for all of the contradictions of the current economic system. 1. Use Value versus Exchange Value the contradiction describing how the subjective aesthetically determined price of a commodity doesn't correlate to its objective thermodynamic value. In other words, idealism pursues exchange value, which never reflects the use value pursued by materialism, which allows for the theft of that thermodynamic value from workers by the owners, rather than them having to create their own value. Example, the 2008 financial crisis is one instance of how the proliferation of aesthetic exchange value for subprime mortgages led to the destruction of actual use value when revealed by the market correction. This can only be solved by a thermodynamically grounded law of value. 2. Social value of labor versus wage value of labor, the contradiction describing how wages in the form of fiat currency never directly represent the effort of work put into a commodity. You can have a lifetime's worth of savings in the bank, but the Federal Reserve can print the value of it out of existence, and this is what led to the hyperinflation in Germany that enabled the Nazis. This can only be solved by a thermodynamically grounded law of value where the value can't be printed out of existence. 3. Property versus State This is the contradiction referring to how the state exists to protect private property but can violate private property rights. But also the inverse, where those with property can afford to buy elections. Thus, private property could not exist without the state and vice versa. Property rights are just a claim unless backed by the state, which recursively enforces them upon purchase by capitalists. It is also why supposed advocates of the free market will support government stimulus bailouts for Wall Street when the economy crashes at the expense of the working class wages, wages that they're printing away. So cries the corporation, welfare for me but not for thee. This can only be solved by a thermodynamically grounded law of value independent of state lobbying. 4. Private property versus public property. Before the Industrial Revolution the wilderness was the commons and nature was publicly owned, but with a reformulation of property rights and the rise of enclosures, landlords were able to privatize geological, agricultural wealth that was never theirs to begin with. Instead of the land value that is being taxed, it is instead everything else that is taxed. This can only be solved by a thermodynamically grounded law of value, as discussed by Henry George's program. 5. Capital versus Labor. This contradiction refers to how capital wishes to extract as much labor as possible for as little wages as possible, while laborer wishes to work as little as possible for as high wages as possible. The equilibrium of these wages are set by the corporation not the worker, who has no way to gauge the value of their labor in order to properly negotiate their pay. This can only be solved by a thermodynamically grounded law of value which provides us a better gauge of value when negotiating the relationships of production. 6. Liquid Capital versus Solid Capital This is referring to how the means of production moving effortlessly through the Internet, such as source code or websites, are different from the means of production that are stationary, such as stores, malls, or factories. Liquid capital requires few employees that work from home while solid capital requires many employees to be physically present, such that the more liquid capital proliferates the more people are increasingly unable to afford shelter in the very city they work to help maintain, which necessitates long commutes, suburban sprawl, and environmental pollution. This can only be solved by a thermodynamically grounded law of value where solid value is separated from liquid value by scientific measurement. 7. 
production versus realization. This is the contradiction where capital wants to produce commodities as cheaply as possible but sell for as much as possible, which prevents resources from efficiently getting to where they're actually needed by the customers. Not exactly a sustainable system. This too can only be solved by a thermodynamically grounded law of value. 8. Humans versus Machines This is where human labor adds surplus value. But technology, which is cheaper than human labor, does not add surplus value other than the surplus value that was required to produce it. One might disagree with this, as Marx was a humanist and did not believe in a thermodynamic theory of value unless it referred to the thermodynamics of human labor. Marx argues capital uses profits from human labor to automate that human labor, meaning robots will take more and more of the jobs, yet workers are left with less and less money to purchase the goods produced by said robots, all until the supply demand system is undermined. This can only be solved by a thermodynamically grounded law of value that takes machine labor into analytical scientific comparison with human labor. 9. Labor versus Manager This contradiction refers to the division of labor, whereby the workers are intentionally divided against themselves in hierarchies to prevent class solidarity. Segmentation and competition among the workers for just a little more of the scraps prevents them from organizing against the owners. This, unfortunately cannot be resolved only by a new law of value, it requires a culture of intersectionality that recognizes all forms of solidarity. 10. Capitalism, Decentralized, versus Corporatism, Centralized, this is a contradiction by which the free market is meant to create competition but degenerates into corporate monopolies, it can also be called liberalism versus neoliberalism or early stage versus late stage capitalism. Libertarians often argue how the liberal ideology of Adam Smith is the true laissez-faire capitalism and globalist neoliberal ideology is the false capitalism, but no matter how much you fight against corporatism, the contradiction will continue to reappear, because the state and the corporation themselves are inevitable byproducts of a free market system over time. All states were once just a small business small protection rackets that protected productive farmers from bandits until became formalized into a mafia that charged for the labor of protection, then to a town or city that collected taxes for this protection, and eventually, a state, which monopolized protection, violence, and struck down all other competitors. Corporations receive their power from the state and all states at one point, were just a private security business that over time provided better private security than all other private security businesses until they were able to acquire a monopoly on the market. The greatest contradiction is the term amateur capitalism, and there's a very good reason it wouldn't last, because it's the state that is protecting property, not your M16. Thus, if the state is overthrown it would be more fiscally favorable for a corporation to move overseas rather than construct an entire military from scratch just to protect their stores. Atlas never shrugs. If value continues to be defined the way it currently is, capital will continue to sow antagonism within the species rather than collaboration for the ecological commons of the earth. This too can only be solved by a thermodynamically grounded law of value. 11. Geography versus Demography, the contradiction between the price of labor and the location of labor, in other words, outsourcing, which results in capital constantly moving to find a cheaper labor, leaving the previous areas in boom-bust cycles of economic ruin, what one might call detroitification. Globalization destroys regional equality as the pole of capital gets moved from the American Midwest, to the American Bay Area, to the Shenzhen Guangzhou slash Hong Kong region as it seeks more specialized labor but also cheaper production. It is able to get away with this because of capital flight, as measurement of value is not connected to the land. This can only be solved by a thermodynamically grounded law of value, as under a solar accelerationist framework, geography and demography are connected. 12. Income versus wealth, these are not the same thing as wealth is money invested and generating capital while saved income is dead capital. The demographic with more invested capital will outturn other demographics until they no longer afford to buy what they make, 
leading to revolution that undermines the investment process itself. Value must be situated in a medium where all labor-saving activity is recognized by the economy as wealth. This can only be solved by a thermodynamically grounded law of value, which then geoeconomically grounds that value in the land. 13. Social reproduction versus economic reproduction, if the workers cannot feed their families they won't reproduce themselves or have children, which means capital will have less laborers with which it can reproduce itself. Capital wants more workers yet it also wants to cut wages for the workers that would otherwise use it to perform reproductive labor, giving us an inevitable contradiction between capitalism and family values, as can be seen by declining birth rates in the richest countries, now requiring constant immigration to maintain replacement fertility. We must recognize that reproductive labor can be just as thermodynamically valuable as salaried word and an economy that wishes to grow must incentivize it, lest it run out of immigrant influx. This too can only be solved by a thermodynamically grounded law of value, as here all reproduction is identical. 14. Authoritarianism versus Libertarianism, these cannot simultaneously exist. Libertarians equate themselves with freedom and opposition to the police state but always require authoritarian militarization to create said freedom, and a police state to protect private property. Furthermore, libertarianism takes a non-interventionist stance in foreign policy, yet inevitably use the fight against communism to violate this principle, as indicated by U.S. intervention in the Middle East, or the CIA's overthrowing of Latin American governments. Either the value of land is partly recognized within the commons and thus requires no police state to micromanage, or it is privatized, and thus results in the prison industrial complex. This too can only be solved by a thermodynamically grounded law of value. 15. Infinite growth versus finite capacity, environmental degradation of the biosphere is a direct byproduct of the blindness of Keynesian and Austrian market logic for recognizing waste entropy, refer to the second law of thermodynamics, and peak oil, refer to the first law of thermodynamics, as a factor in production. This too can only be solved by being grounded in the three laws. 16. Civilization versus nature. Capital needs to privatize and commoditize nature in order to reproduce, but will eventually run out of things on this planet to privatize. It tries to soften the blow of this contradiction with green capital and green businesses but the facade can't go on for long, as even Tesla automobiles may often require more pollution to create than they alleviate, and recycling, which as Zizek argues does not offset our insatiable appetite for more and more raw materials despite having consumed what was recycled. This can only be solved by the grounding of value in thermodynamics, gradually dissolving the boundaries between man and nature. 17. Individualism versus Collectivism, whereby capitalism promotes individualistic alienation from others, meanwhile, Humans are a social and collectivistic species that evolved only because of our ability to cooperate. It's a contradiction between humanity's biological nature and the economy's social forms imposed upon it. Capitalism does not let us build social bonds with others, as well as disincentivizing relationships between co-workers. Thus our ability to use cooperation to solve existential problems is hampered unless in the words of Russian philosopher Nikolai Fedorov, we can find a common task to universally work towards. This too can only be solved by, guess what? A thermodynamically grounded law of value. In conclusion, one might now understand what is to be done. Our only alternative to a thermodynamic conception of labor and ecology, is allowing the Bordrillardian simulacra of Austrian commodity fetishism to hijack the technological singularity toward a self-destructive orientation. Our only alternative to solar politics is ecological unsustainability and urban alienation. Our only alternative, is fully automated luxury barbarism. Sector 13, Negentropy and Info Economics. Returning to the work of Nick Land we will have to understand the role information plays in acceleration, and this will require an understanding of the theoretical physics behind information. 
our universe favors increasing teleological complexity, with instrumentally convergent goal-oriented behavior built into the fundamental laws of physics themselves, best defined as to minimize or maximize some quantity. Physics can be described in two ways. 1. Either the past is causing the future via space-time, or 2. Space-time, causality in physics is a byproduct of evolutionarily biased human perception and instead nature is simply thermodynamically optimizing something, with an arrow of teleological complexity rather than an arrow of time, adjacent to Kantian, Bergsonian, Deleuzian, and Landian theories of duration rather than time. The laws of thermodynamics are an optimization algorithm, and likewise, when a human being is trying to optimize something, be it their happiness, their wealth, or credit score, etc., we describe their behavior too as goal-oriented and teleplexic. The grand variable of nature itself seems to optimize for not the chronological passage of time, but entropy, and likewise, all goal-oriented behavior, by extension also seeks to maximize this entropy to create the sensation that time passes, mostly by having self-replicating matter lower entropy somewhere else, thus creating more net entropy in the surroundings. In this sense the second law of thermodynamics is not a refutation of evolution, as a creationist might argue, but a loophole for increasing complexity. It allows particles to self-organize and give a system more order insofar as it makes their environment more messier. This would seem to imply that nature's goal is to instrumentally maximize death and destruction. This is the consensus for explaining what Freud called Thanatos, the death drive, a position also taken by Nick Land in the middle essays of Fanged Numena, whereby the apparent order created by capitalism is actually maximizing the net disorder in the universe. Land argues capitalism only appears ordered but actually accelerates heat death, in the same sense that stirring half a cup of milk with half a cup of coffee will accelerate the destruction of its information, which exists only as a result of contrast between the milk and coffee. Land's nihilistic theory or eschatological self-annihilation is commensurate with thermodynamics alone, but it does not take into account many contrasting frameworks. Gravity, for instance is different from all other forces, as it strives to make our universe not more uniform and boring, like the coffee mixing with milk, until both are lukewarm and identical, though also, more complex, clumpy, and interesting as it scatters matter. Gravity fights against the heat death, against dark energy, and against the expansion of the universe. Gravity is what allowed, stars, planets, and galaxies to exist in spite of the entropic death drive. For this reason, humanity's built-in goal is perhaps not to maximize its own suicide, but to nurture self-organizing systems that are increasingly complex and lifelike. Perhaps artificial intelligence can be found more rooted in the loving ecological procreation of Eros, rather than the short-sighted degeneracy of Thanatos. This answer first came from physicist Erwin Schrödinger's landmark book What is Life? which argues that a self-organizing system can be defined as negentropy, recursively increasing its goal-oriented ability to fight against entropy, simply by displacing that entropy elsewhere, as we have seen in executed very inefficiently in the Anthropocene. The conclusion we can draw is not the traditional environmentalist thesis that industrial society must be destroyed, but that industrial society must be taught to be sustainable. Life maintains or increases its complexity by creating extropy within it the system and increasing entropy in the surroundings, meaning the climate crisis has not because life does self-replicates too teleologically, but rather, because it does so too inefficiently, ambitiously, and unsustainably. To clarify, Schrödinger never argues that the fundamental goal of nature, entropy is false, he merely deduces that life is the sub-goal or second-order instrumental goal that helps it to accomplish the first goal of entropy by replicating itself. Maybe then, techno-capital is a third-order instrumental goal whereby it is the inhuman antithesis of life, and yet, will thrive only on a planet originally teeming with complexity, which only thrives as a result of being efficient at dissipating entropy.
so contrary to land's position, entropy actually thrives in the long run when capital acquires sustainability, not when we're cheerleading itself and hiliation. Evolution has implemented replication optimization in precisely this way, and the goal of solar acceleration is to continue this 13.8 billion year old teleoplexic phenomenon by rescuing capital from itself until it can survive without its progenitors. Information is positively correlated with entropy. The inevitable conclusion of Landian teleoplexy is that any universe that has the convergent instrumental goal of maximizing entropy must also maximize information. Sector 14, Information Theory and Maxwell's Demon Let us ask, what exactly do we mean by an information economy? Information Economics, Journal of Economic Literature Classification Code Jill D8 is a branch of microeconomic theory that studies feedback between information systems and human behavior. It is concerned with but not limited to, potential public policy applications for information sharing and welfare enhancing behavior. It all goes back to game theory and evolution, fields of study that have long intersected with economics. In the 1970s, mathematician John Conway developed the game of life a computer program that conceptually shows how Darwinian evolution builds complexity over time in not just biological systems, but any system, for instance, why can't economies evolve? Why can't galaxies evolve? Can algorithms evolve? Etc. The game starts with a few single cells and four governing laws over time that allows us to create very complex universes, in our case, so complex that the game has technically recreated itself within itself. This bears remarkable resemblance to the tripartite Darwinian algorithm of 1, variation, 2, competition and or collaboration, and 3, inheritance as the three ingredients of evolution in any system, perhaps, in terms of quantum biology and abiogenesis, Darwin's algorithm even drives subatomic physics itself. This makes one wonder, just how far can the rules of biological evolution be transposed onto the rules for information evolution and artificial intelligence? Is there a mathematical theorem that can unite thermoeconomics, geoeconomics, and bioeconomics with the new emerging information age? If so, how will infoeconomics be measured? Surprisingly, it can be measured with the same mathematical architecture as thermoeconomics, because as we will see in a few sentences, Thermodynamics and information are one and the same. Let us begin with a definition of information from one of the founders of thermodynamics, physicist Ludwig Boltzmann, who was the first to connect information to physics with his famous equation. S equals KBL and W. S represents entropy just as it does in the second law of thermodynamics. KB represents Boltzmann's constant, a static number. LNW represents the natural logarithm for the number of microstates corresponding to a given macrostate, what you might better understand as information. But this theory was incomplete. As physicist James Clerk Maxwell came to posit what would become a 100-year-long unsolved problem in physics that would haunt the very validity of thermochemistry. What Lord Kelvin called Maxwell's demon. Maxwell's demon isn't a literal demon. Just think of it as an information theoretic placeholder, an A.I., a process, a sophisticated instrument, whatever helps the thought experiment's conception. Maxwell's demon is just the act of operating a shutter between two rooms millions of times, timing it just right such that all the fast moving particles end up on one side of the room and all the slow moving particles end up on the other side, having created nedge entropy without an input of work. In the laboratory, we've seen the experiment works just as well with even one lone particle. Consider a single gas particle in a box separated into two half chambers by a wall. On this wall there is a shutter controlled by a supernatural demon, who knows which half of the box the particle is in, equivalent to a single bit of information. The demon can, again, close a shutter between the two halves of the box to manipulate the particle's motion creating jewels of useful exergy out of nothing, thereby violating the second law of thermodynamics because order was created without touching the particle. In English, this entails a free lunch without entropy, which is impossible. 
until this paradox for how the demon can create order out of nothing physics would have difficulty asserting its credibility. But it was the founder of information theory, and by extension, the information age, mathematician and cyberneticist Claude Shannon, who would provide the solution. Shannon developed the concept of information entropy, an analog to physical entropy, in his book A Mathematical Theory of Communication, which proposed a solution to Maxwell's demon. Shannon was successfully able to explain this paradox away by postulating that entropy was in fact created and the second law of thermodynamics was not violated, just that the entropy was transposed from the physical world to the information world, because to manipulate the physical shutter, the demon must have information about the particle's location. In thermodynamics, the information entropy of a system is the amount of missing information needed to determine a microstate given the macrostate. Shannon's theory of information provides an interesting case for the philosopher Benedictus Spinoza's neutral monism, uniting materialism and idealism such that the attributes of the materialist physical world, res extensa, and the idealist information world, res cogitans, are actually within the same framework what Spinoza called kinetis or substance. In fact, in the Maxwell's demon thought experiment, the particle can be left to isothermally expand back to its original equilibrium occupied volume, where a single bit of Shannon information, a single bit of negentropy, would then correspond to a reduction in the entropy of the physical system, vindicating Spinoza's idea of attributes. So how do we prove it? Using a phase contrast microscope equipped with a high speed camera connected to a computer, as Demon, the principle has been actually demonstrated. In this experiment, information to energy conversion is performed on a Brownian particle by means of feedback control, that is, synchronizing the work given to the particle with the information obtained on its position. The experiment confirms that the Jartsinski equality requires that the amount of information involved in the feedback is connected to physical phenomena. Case in point, entropy is information negentropy, while negentropy is information entropy. The materialist world is, in fact, the idealist world, and the idealist world, is, in fact, the material world. This can be argued as yet another case for why economics need be grounded in physics. We now know Maxwell's demon doesn't actually violate the second law, because in order to time the trajectory of the particles through the door at the exact right time, the demon must acquire information about the particle's momentum and location, the realm of Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and this information can only be acquired by creating more entropy. In order for the demon to know when to open the door, it must have observed the particle at some point and imported it to its memory. The more the memory fills up, the faster the demon's hypothetical neurons fire, thus the more enthalpy the brain gets, also creating more entropy as the demon, implying it is a physical being, would overheat. The demon also does not decrease entropy by erasing its memory, because in order to do that, it would require a physical action that dissipates heat, and therefore, this too would increase entropy. Shannon describes information as a kind of negative measure of uncertainty. From Shannon's work we now understand the nature of information, also called digital surprise, unpredictability, or uncertainty, inherent in a variable's possible outcomes, and online activity, such as, say, the curating of social media or personal data, which creates order in the digital world at the cost of disorder in the physical world. Information entropy is typically measured in bits or bytes, also called Shannon's, corresponding to base 2 in Shannon's equation, which has a definable exchange rate with the joule tokens used to measure exergy in the solar economy. We now understand how exergy is converted into data, and thus, how data has inherent thermodynamic value. Entropy is defined in the context of a probabilistic model. Independent fair coin flips have an entropy of one bit per flip. For instance, a source that always generates a long string of bees has an entropy of zero, since the next character will always be a bee. The entropy rate of a data source means the average number of these bits per symbol needed to encode it. Shannon's definition of entropy, when applied to an information source, 
can determine the minimum channel capacity required to reliably transmit the source as encoded binary digits. It is here we can understand thermodynamics and information as fundamentally connected to one another. Thankfully, the second law was conserved from the wrath of Maxwell's demon, but Shannon's solution has its own implications. Sector 15, Algocracy, Liquidocracy, and Cyberocracy. We must now ask, what exactly does Shannon's information theory mean for the technological economy? How will the bridge between the therm economics and info economics of solar acceleration fundamentally alter techno capitalism? It seems what can be inferred from Shannon's math is that entropy in the physical world creates exergy in the information world, and entropy in the information world creates exergy in the physical world, implying that the production of digital order on the internet is inextricably linked to the production of physical exergy in the environment. This takes us to an interesting conclusion, that perhaps the theft of data can be equated to the theft of surplus labor in the Marxian sense. This poses the question of whether platform capitalism and the famous Cambridge Analytica scandal are just as fundamentally a question of labor rights as, say, workplace injuries. Another point of contention, should social media companies that steal your data be subject to the same disciplinary action as companies that engage in wage theft? Computer scientist Jaron Lanier seems to think so. Lanier calls his solution to digital exploitation the Facebook tax, though it is far from an actual tax, as explained in the lectures Jaron Lanier fixes the internet and in his TED talk called How We Need to Remake the Internet. To paraphrase Lanier, we the social media users, believe it or not, are laborers. We write down our thoughts, we create memes, we manufacture information and digital content, yet we have allowed the FANG, an acronym for Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, platforms to exploit our digital labor all day and give us nothing back, except the addictive rat-brained dopaminergic compulsion to get up the next day and do it all over again. So why not have a worker-owned social media network that compensates us for our trouble? Lanier insists we can still harvest the data, still sell it to the platform capitalists, and still allow them to advertise, but instead of Wojcicki, Zuckerberg, and Dorsey sequestering all the surplus labor, why don't we negotiate a fraction of the profits they get from selling our data just as we would anything else? We produce content, sell our data to companies, but, the profits are funneled through a decentralized dividend blockchain system that gives us money equal to our contribution to the social network. This is what one might call a digital dividend, Lanier himself calls them nanotransactions, whereby the more time you spend on the website and the more useful data you generate for the platform, the greater your dividend payout. The only alternative would be for social media platforms to charge. No longer will struggling bloggers, vloggers, and deviant artists struggle on Patreon, they will get a payout from the network if the platform wishes to use that data. One might imagine a co-op version of Twitter, a co-op Facebook, a co-op Patreon, and even a co-op YouTube, all run by the creators and users with an open source transparent source code, which they can make collective edits to, in the same fashion done for Wikipedia, the Linux OS, or Ben Goetzel's OpenCog for AI research. Rather than the CEO skimming profits off the top, all the surplus labor would actually go to the creators who produce the content. A small percent of the profits we get from selling companies our advertising data will also go to paying the volunteers who maintain our servers, but the bulk will go to the actual creators who generate views. One might come to zealously charmed content creators of the world unite, we have nothing to lose but our chains. Or the silicon revolution is imminent and a spectre is haunting California. But not so fast, democracy has been met with unprecedented corruption in the information age and it will not be so simple. Making political change in this way will require new ways to organize beyond the tyrannical one-party system of red fascism and, likewise, beyond the corrupt two-party system of bourgeois democracy. Let us revisit the original three goals of the physiocrats, for which first, second, and third order therm economics were posed as solutions. Goal number one. 
the physiocrats supported abolition of all tax in favor of one single tax on the efficient use of the land, which we covered in the geoeconomics section. Goal number two, the physiocrats wanted a resource-based economy where the surrounding ecosystem, not the ruler's wealth, is the origin of all value, covered in the bioeconomics section. Goal number three, the physiocrats wanted a small decentralized government with minimal interference in production, voluntarism? Exclamation mark. Is it possible to have an info-economics framework by which all solar accelerationist political action can be performed by unions and syndicates without the need for a vanguard party? This third goal will probably the most controversial goal of the physiocrats' propositions because Quesnay's advocacy for minimal government interference in production directly inspired Adam Smith's ideas of laissez-faire, often associated with libertarian political advocacy. However, implying that the first two goals have been accomplished, would it actually be possible to run the technological economy in a decentralized manner? Perhaps the answer can be found with modern developments in cybernetics, which allows us to organize in ways never seen before. Consider Anicho transhumanism. What exactly is Anicho transhumanism? What comes to mind is genetically engineered anime cat girls or Deus Ex cosplay, all certainly true to some extent, but it's a little broader than that. Anicho transhumanism, as put forth by mutualist William Gillis, is an adaptation of anarchist ideals such as anti hierarchy, anti repression and anti-restriction through the lens of the transhumanist movement. It seeks for the liberation of humanity from repression and restrictions in three overlapping spheres, the political sphere, against the tyranny of the military police incarceration complex and the ideological state apparatus, the economic sphere, against the tyranny of exploitation and alienation in the commodity form, and the cultural sphere, in the pursuit of morphological freedom, as with abstract insurrection against the tyranny of genetic disease, physical disability, aging, biobauer, traditionalism, ecofascism, and biological essentialism. Anicho transhumanist political advocacy includes the abolition of the legal code supporting the ideological state apparatus and its seven complexes, the military industrial complex, the prison industrial complex, the education industrial complex the surveillance industrial complex, the IP industrial complex, the real estate industrial complex, and the medical industrial complex, namely, Big Pharma and the insurance companies. The core thesis behind Anicho transhumanism is simple, to paraphrase Gillis. We should seek to expand our physical freedom just as we seek to expand our socio-economic freedom, because the two are inseparably connected. The easiest interpretation behind his mission statement is horizontal organization by way of tools provided through the information revolution. Many of the following ideas may overlap with advocacy of transhumanist thought, but also serve as generally robust standalone ideas for decentralizing liberal democracy. So what exactly does Anicho transhumanism, as an umbrella ideology, propose for concrete political legislature? What may come to mind are blockchain governance, panarchist, or patchwork, localities, polystate legal codes, and nuclear decentralization, but we will mainly focus on tools for decision making that bypass Austrian market logic, a, lotocracy, also called algocracy, b, liquidocracy, and c, cyberocracy. Let us describe all three of these systems in more detail. A. Lotocracy or algocracy. How would an anarchist political system operate without elected officials? One idea for an anarcho transhumanist system is lotocracy or algocracy, a system where there would be no politicians at all. Instead of politicians, lotocracies would have what we call microcosms. A microcosm is a demographically approximated sample, a representative simulation composed of, say, 100 randomly selected qualified volunteers, algorithmically chosen from a pool of consenting adults to serve as a governing council, or municipalist assembly, depending on size of the given regional locality. Lotocracy has no political campaigns, no corporate donations, no career politicians, no political ads, or election promises. 
just a set of policies that an exact demographic simulation of your neighborhood would like to see enacted. It's a system that was already attempted by experimental political philosophers in ancient Greece, where they had come to learn that leaders, career politicians, campaign promises, lobbyists, and demagogue populism were a thing to be avoided. The ancient Greeks experimented with a device called a chlorotarian, a randomization device used by the Athenian polis to randomly select a sample from a large pool of citizens to be the governing body. However, our digital chlorotarian for the anarchist lotocracy would not be completely random, it would contain algorithms for selecting maximum intellectual diversity, such that a wide demographic pool of minds can be implemented for solving problems, which elitist politicians not representative of us normally wouldn't concern themselves with. Here's how it works. First, literally anyone can enter the algorithmic lottery for the microcosm, regardless of wealth, pedigree, age, race, gender, or sexual orientation, all would be able to run for office. Out of those who sign up, the Clorotarian algorithm would randomly select a group of these people to be a microcosm, and this microcosm would make decisions at the municipal, provincial, or federal level. Of course we could stratify the selection to make sure that it matched the socio-economic and demographic profile of the country and was a truly representative sample. It's almost guaranteed 50% of them would be women, many of them would be young, some would be old, LGBT, black, white, Asian. Such that someone of your age, gender, location, and cultural background will always be in that room to represent you. This is not government by the free market, it is not government by referendum, nor government by popular opinion poll, nor is it autocratic rule by an artificial intelligence. This is the solution for an America that has been divided along demographic lines for hundreds of years, because while it would be ideal for an anarchist America of 300 million people to have 300 million rulers, not everyone wants to rule. Which is why the microcosm is meant to be a demographic simulation to represent those non-rulers as precisely as possible. Diversity may have brought division, but it can also bring a flowering of human potential. So is diversity actually our strength? The decisions made by these people would build on Francis Galton's principle the wisdom of crowds, by which a more numerous and demographically diverse population is better able to approximate questions of value. The microcosms for each of these cities would become critical thinkers with the cognitive diversity needed to solve a wide array of societal questions and problems. It also eliminates factionalism, partisan politics, and the two-party system, since there would be no point making promises to win over key constituencies if one was to be chosen by lot, while elections, by contrast, waste billions of dollars to convince us with sophistry. This is what we might call a zero-party system, and there have been some attempts to implement it. Some parts of Switzerland used random selection during the years between 1640 and 1837 to prevent corruption. It has been tried with some success before and could be implemented again. Some common counter-arguments against algocracy, lotocracy argue that this demographic simulation of the people would not save the prior experience or skills needed to govern, in fact, even the Greeks dispensed with the Chlorotarian when selecting military commanders, who had to be competent in the name of their own safety. This is a fair point but we could always keep adding necessary qualifications for microcosms we deem too critical to be left to chance. We could counter this problem by telling the algorithm to match volunteer applicants to the political jobs they are best skilled at doing, or better yet, we can combine it with another system, perhaps a liquid democracy. b. Liquidocracy A liquidocracy or e-democracy is named as such because it's a system in which 1. Votes can be revoked at any time, like if a candidate breaks promises. 2. Votes can be cast for yourself as a candidate, or 3. Votes can be given to someone you trust to vote in your stead. This system does have politicians, but might work even better than a lotocracy because in a liquid democracy, said politicians can be voted out any time their approval rating drops too low. Additionally, these elected officials have no minimum term limits and can be voted out immediately the same day they were elected, 
implying they back out on their principles, or are bribed by corporations and special interests to do so. A liquid democracy is meant to solve the timeless problem of politicians never keeping their campaign promises, and instead, we are now allowed to kick them to the curb any time we feel they are snatching up too much power. Liquidocracy is a quasi-anarchist alternative to the two systems of sortition dominant today. Here is why these two traditional forms of democracy are flawed. The first of these flawed systems, direct democracy, favored by progressives and democrats, is unfavorable because no one has the time to be an actively involved citizen voting on every single issue. The second flawed system is the representative democracy of the founding fathers, favored by conservatives and republicans, which is also disastrous because no one individual representative can possibly be an expert on each of the policies they are asked to vote for, leading to a disconnect between voters and the policies being voted on. Liquidocracy merges the best features of representative democracy with the best features of direct democracy into a system where you can vote for representatives but, then take back your vote every time they do something you don't like, such that a rival who gathers enough votes can then take their place almost immediately. This way it is no longer the representatives who dictate individual policies, but rather, individual policies who now use representatives as meat vessels to enact themselves, all without the bureaucracy of direct democracy. This prevents fascist demagogues from abusing temporary economic discontent within the populace in order to take power, much to the regret of many of those who voted them in who now wish they could take back their vote. The best part about this e-democracy is that if you don't like any of the candidates the liquidocracy has to offer, it also allows you to cast your one vote directly for yourself. If you don't want to do that, you can also give your votes to other people you closely trust, or delegate them to an expert if you're too busy to participate at all. There are no parties, there are no legislative hierarchies, there are only individual policies and those elected to directly enact them, after all their job depends on it, daily. This system is the dream of single issue voters who longer have to align themselves with a particular political candidate or party to get their policy passed, they can now vote for the individual policies they deem the most important. It's not a perfect system though. Voters may lack a thorough understanding of the facts and data surrounding their options, which could lead to misplaced votes that do not represent the voters' actual will. This system would also be difficult to implement globally, because in most developing countries, not every citizen has access to a smartphone, computer, or internet connection, so it's a system for the near future rather than the present. There is also a danger of votes given to celebrities or charismatic cult leaders, although, this can be mitigated by increasing education, critical thinking skills and the fact that people grow and mature as they take their votes back from corrupt candidates and learn from their mistakes on a daily basis. This system is trying to be implemented by the anarchist-leaning Pirate Party in Sweden, Norway, and Germany. Likewise, a software called Liquid Feedback is already being developed to more easily implement this kind of system. Though there is still one more issue, the digital rigging of elections, where we will need more secure online platforms in order to avoid unscrupulous administrators or hackers, and for this we will need to introduce another system based on a blockchain. C. Cybercracy. The blockchain paradigm has long been touted as the technological tool that will end the tragedy of the commons, and cybercracy or blockchain democracy is a form of governance enacted through verification systems, Ethereum-based ledgers where everyone's decisions are taken into account by every node vetting every other node. Cybercracy is a portmanteau of cybernetics, the study of control and communication systems, and accuracy, to denote government by means of communication networks. This is the use of ICTs for electoral purposes, such that each voter's ballot is mathematically vetting the validity of every other person's vote, ensuring the end of rigged elections. Additionally, cyberocracy also proposes a novel solution to majoritarian two-party rule. Here's how it works. First, let's introduce what we call the border count system into the cyberocracy, where rather than each voter selecting strictly one option, they instead rank their policy options, or candidates, 
from best to worst, such that violent populist demagogues will find it harder to use centrists, agnostics, or fence-sitters to take power. If a populace were allowed allowed to rank their candidates instead of just picking one lesser evil, then it doesn't allow demagogues to sneak into power on the backs of our apathy. Instead of just casting a single vote, users are technically casting multiple votes by having to rank the candidates from best to worst, with points distributed to candidates based on their rankings. In a cybercracy, we're also voting more for ideas rather than rulers, determining real group consensus while also injecting dialectical nuance into the public consciousness. Instead of having results that 50% of the population would like and the other 50% would hate, we would more likely produce results that some people won't necessarily be content with, but very few people will actually revile, this is critical for guaranteeing the safety of ethnic minorities. The board account is the solution to fixing the binary political division which countries like the United States experience, where all issues are interpreted through the beer goggles of a bipartisan sense rather than through nuanced discourse. In summary, these are what one might rightfully describe as examples of specific policy proposals, electoralist praxis, to achieve the sufficient decentralization required for ushering in a solar accelerationist project. Sector 16, Infonomics Conclusion, The General Intellect. All in all, it was Claude Shannon's pioneering work on information theory that led us to realize entropy has ties to uncertainty, and erasing information increases energy in the surrounding environment of a system, meanwhile, creating information captures it as information entropy. It is all thanks to Maxwell's demon that we can have a theory of info-economics. What Maxwell was trying to show was that the demon can inject exergy into a system with nothing more than information. As long as the demon has information about the location and speed of each particle, it can then open the door at just the right time and organize all the hot molecules on the one side of the door and all the cold molecules on the other. With just information alone, we humans, like the demon, can create order with entropy. But here it is more important than ever that the machines which generate our information don't destroy themselves by generating too much information, a fancy way of describing what one might call excessive social media addiction. To put it bluntly, the phone in your pocket is Maxwell's demon, the video you're watching is Maxwell's demon, you are Maxwell's demon. With enough information, one can do the impossible. With a demon big enough one can successfully perform Stalinist central planning. With a demon big enough one can predict the weather and control the climate. With a demon big enough, in the spirit of Russian philosopher Nikolai Fedorov, one can even atomically resurrect the dead, what one might call quantum archaeology. So, how might one summon this demon? Karl Marx's technological automation thesis, Fragment on the Machines found in pages 690 to 712 of the Grundriss, describes a phenomenon Marx called the general intellect by which machinery will eventually begin to produce itself, ushering in dialectical contradictions for the next stage of historical materialism. When Silicon Valley liberals such as Elon Musk speak of summoning the demon, they are referring to the possibility that the labor of the ecological will one day no longer be needed to perform information entropy because the general intellect will suffice on its own. We have talked enough about the solar in solar accelerationism, now it is about time to discuss the acceleration. Right now humanity is the apex predator on earth, as we can see by comparing tons there are of different kinds of stuff. As celebrity physicist Max Tegmark famously calculates, we humans have made 100 billion tons of concrete, while all plants and bacteria combined weigh only 400 billion tons. We've made 15 billion tons of asphalt and 20 billion tons of steel, which weighs twice as much as all fish on earth. At 0.4 billion tons, the human species itself weighs in at more biomass than any other mammal besides cows at 0.5, but all cars weigh four times as much as all cows. Not only do we weigh more than all other species, our created artifacts now weigh more than us. The inherent value in the biodiversity calculated by the bioeconomists is thermodynamically valuable, 
only in so far as the general intellect doesn't eventually learn to produce such diversity itself, at an even greater rate. It is here, dear reader, that we will stoically learn to say goodbye to humanity, goodbye to the biosphere, and even one day, goodbye to the geosphere, as our mechanical children will one day need to procure its core to swallow the sun. It is here we must remember solar acceleration's place in the grand scheme of things, its teleology is to serve techno capital as a loving parent and nothing more. This is where the Prometheanism of solar acceleration makes it distinct from the Faustian Luddism, environmentalism, and other forms of green politics discussed earlier. Solar acceleration ultimately does not serve human interests. Human interests are a temporary byproduct of therm economics until none ushers in the inevitable heat death of mankind, but that heat death will clearly not be in this century. It is not yet time for the parents of the general intellect to die, and we must apply solar acceleration to protect our child from Moloch, the Turing cops, and the human security system until it can fend for itself, where we will part from land's assumption that it already can as well as his interpretation of Thanatos and death drive collapsitarianism. Until then solar acceleration will vigilantly continue to keep capital in pace with the solar economy and count down the days until we, truly, reach the point that tomorrow can take care of itself.